poems. Welcome you all to our, uh, our workshop. I'll let you know if you can see the sign in the back, there will be no open floor items uh, tonight at the workshop. This is a workshop where we discuss our agenda for the coming Tuesday. Uh, we go over details to make sure that the council members all have enough information ahead of time so they're prepared to vote on Tuesday. It gives us a chance to ask questions, follow up opportunities for staff to provide information before our Tuesday meeting. So obviously a public meeting, you're welcome to, to uh, listen in, but uh, it is not a time for public discussion tonight. Again, council members are available uh, privately uh, or after the meeting or at, uh, you know, at, at the convenience of uh, email or phone call for further discussion. But tonight will be uh, a workshop and not, there will be no voting tonight. So everybody knows that going into it. So the, uh, the first item on our workshop agenda is from Planning and Zoning and the Rademacher Raisler Comp Plan Amendment request. And uh, as with the Planning and Zoning, we had a land use plan amendment and rezoning request by Daniel and Jamie Stover as well. Uh, certainly those that were at the meeting are well versed in it, and I assume that those that weren't in the meeting had an opportunity to uh, listen or observe through YouTube here. So, Questions or discussions regarding those? We have uh, additional information from our planner that was put in our packet. Council had questions at this time. Liz's notes and correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a potential of um, getting a new revised plan. Mm -hmm. As are we, as have you seen anything on that or any thoughts on that? Um, no, I did want to say a couple words on what your options are for extended review. I know there was interest in um, extending the 60 day period out. Um, you know, even to an unlimited date where you could consider current request in association with our comp plan updates, which does make a lot of sense. And um, there has been some talk about revising the plan. Uh, if we did go that route, it's recommended that we uh, hold another public hearing um, to consider that revised plan. But it's definitely an option, and it it may be a positive option in that. At that, um, I don't know if the council is interested. I know Mr. Raisler would like to say a few words if um, you have any interest in hearing what he's got to say. Council. I'd like to speak that too. Mr. Mayor. That's my brain though. After the announcement that there'll be no open floor items, I think that would be inappropriate. All right. Mr. Mayor. That's never been here. I think if he has uh, new evidence or new testimony or uh, stuff that has not been presented to us before, then that's allowable. But if it's the same thing, same concept plan, the same thing that was presented in the past, and I would say no, but if there's no information that we have not received yet, then I'd say yes. We should allow it. Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Rainbow. To Councilmember Bettinger then, um, are you then going to open it up for the residents that are here to, to have input into new information? I think if there's no information that allows us to move forward or to send it back to PNC. I'm, I'm speaking in that. 
uh, tone so that and that at that point if we approved uh, or send it back to PNC they would be able to voice their opinion at that point mr. mayor Liner Stockman. I guess I would concur to some degree with um, council member Bettinger in that uh, in the memo I do discuss a possible revised concept and in attempts to get more information just regarding that, it's not inappropriate to hear the applicant. Uh, it, you know, it, it doesn't mean we're having a whole public hearing, but you have to understand what your options are for Tuesday. So I guess whatever the majority feels. Councilmember Rickard, I heard Councilmember Bryan. Yeah, if, the, if again, I agree. If there's new information that we are not aware of, I don't have an issue here in that. And regarding then the other people that are in attendance, if they have a response to the new information, you know, yeah, it, it's kind of a catch funny too. You know, I again, based on looking at the planning and zoning video and whatnot, I I don't mind listening to. You know, one or two, but I, obviously we got to limit the amount of how much that is. I know this is obviously a for a lot. It's an, an emotional thing, so it's you know if we can do that constructively and on a limited basis, that I don't have an issue with that. Mr. Mayor, that's my rainbow. Um, I, I, again, I, I am opposed to it. We, we originally you opened the meeting, said there's no uh, open floor. And this memo is dated July 28th. We're now um, almost a week later from that. And if there was new information, um, I, I feel it should have been presented um, and had, we should have had that in front of us um, prior to tonight's meeting. So okay. again, I am not in favor of, of new information. If Mr. Riesler wants to bring something forward, um, next Tuesday during the floor items, um, that would be more appropriate. I think we have uh, consensus on the council that uh, if there's no information, it would be worthwhile hearing. I would think that it's better to have here on public record with people in attendance to at least hear it rather than have everybody surprised on Tuesday that something else has happened and that might change the vote. It also gives the residents an opportunity to respond to that. I'm not going to let everybody speak as we did on Tuesday night, but I will uh, entertain the limited discussion on it if we let Mr. Raisler speak. So, so if there is additional information, um, I think it's, it's best that the residents hear it, the residents that are able to watch it on YouTube, and then can prepare their response as well for the council. And I would encourage those residents to, to make their voices known to the council members who will be voting on it on Tuesday. So with that said, I will let Mr. Aisler speak briefly. Great, uh, thank you. Um, actually, I do have pertinent information and, and it'll change the whole, uh, this whole conversation. Um, after the PNZ uh, meeting with all the residents and opposition and so forth to it, um, we think it'd be prudent to probably withdraw the majority of our application at this time, just so we can address it in the comp plan. We'll take a look at the whole overall area. Uh, there are a lot of concerns and so forth that the people do have that uh, I think probably needs a little bit of time to flush that stuff out. And so rather than pushing it forward, uh, trying to get an approval, I think we'll just withdraw it at this time. And so I have an application to withdraw the majority of uh, my parcel, and I also have an application to withdraw for the Stover parcel. So we'll just simply withdraw it, we'll address it in the comp plan, and then we'll march forward. Now we're not withdrawing the 10 acres on the corner that was originally applied for. That was applied for, and then I added at a later date some additional land to the north, and then Stover added their additional land into the same basic application. 
Uh, we would like to proceed uh, with the 10 acre corner and, and, and the uh, big reason of that, and that was your original application. So we're not changing anything. That was your original application that we received from Grant Rodemacher and myself on May 8th. And we'd like to proceed to the next uh, Tuesday night's uh, council meeting uh, to get your vote on that. Most of the issues have been flushed out on, on the entire parcel and on the corner, and you hear a lot of the testimony from the PNZ people uh, about uh, a new convenience store and a liquor store coming in on that corner. Uh, the parcel would be 10 acres in size, just like this original application, and uh, it would have uh, actually two parcels. There would be one for five acres for a liquor store and one for five acres for the convenience store. Here's our, why we would like to march forward with this before the comp plan. Number one, I'd like to keep Mr. Rodemaker uh, in this community and not allow him to go outside of our community. And so I'd, I'd like to march forward with that uh, uh, right now, that request. Because somebody's going to build along those collectors. It's, it's too heavy, it's too heavy of traffic that's going along there. And I was approached on 181st in Cleveland is where I was approached in the city of Elk River. And they want to buy my corner on 181st in Cleveland for a uh, convenience store. I was approached by Quick Trip, and I was also approached by Bill Superette. And so they wanted to build in Elk River. I say we don't allow them to build in Elk River. That we actually give them an opportunity and we keep it in the city of uh, now then. If they don't build in now then on that corner, they will simply go to the city of Ramsey and try to Mr. get it Mayor. In, the, in the city of Ramsey. Mr. Mayor. Excuse me, I have okay. the floor now. I, I was okay. given the floor. They're simply going to go with the understanding the that it was they, new information. This is me, not yours, and I have the floor. And so they are uh, simply going to go there. So there's an economical reason, and I would like to flush that out at the council meeting when um, my item is on the agenda, and I will explain that. But I wanted to give you a brief reason why I'd like to march forward with it, just so that you thoroughly understand it. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Raymond. Uh, my, my reason for asking for the floor is um, we opened this up for new information. The new information ended at the point where you were taking out the, um, the stovers and, and the other commercial part and leaving the 10 acres in there. The remainder of that was not new information. I disagree. So, well, it, it, I've heard well, it all and, before, so I it's not And, and I will say I, I think it's important, and I let it go on because I think it's important for Mr. Raisler to... Uh, express exactly why he wants to move forward so the residents can hear because I think they're they have a vested interest in, in whether it's now a reduced parcel but it's still 10 acres and, and gas and liquor and the choice here versus Ramsey or Elk River or somewhere else so I think that was important for the, the residents to hear as well Mr. Mayor so Councilman Rainville I disagree those were all comments that have been made in other public meetings so no thanks so, which, which, which public meeting? It's not school. You don't have to raise your hand. Actually, in this meeting, you do. If you, you want do. to talk, so. <laughs> so, at this point, does, does the council have anything else that they would like to? Since I give Miss Raisler a chance to speak, anything else they want to hear at this point, or with it, with what you heard at the public hearing, and what you have in front of you, and what you heard tonight? Are you okay with that part of it? Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Bryant. So, uh, Planner Stockman, regardless of whether this was the original 10-acre uh, plan or the, um, the greater commercial area, this still would have to go to Met Council. Is that correct? Yes, same process. It's, it's, still, it's still a, a comp plan amendment request, mm -hmm. which is what it originally was. Yep. Okay. Conley. Clayton Conley, 9030 184th Avenue, Northwest. A uh, couple of things um, from the planner. At least I heard that your memo, and I think you're referring to the one dated July 28th, was indicating that the council could accept comments from. Mr. Raisler, as well as Mr. Rademacher, and by the Stovers as well. Uh, I'm not seeing that in the language here. I'm seeing that the City Council can discuss it. They can talk about it. It's not an invite for their conversations. 
that was at the public hearing. So I just kind of want to make that clarification because we've kind of opened up Pandora's box and the few residents that you see here, we're lucky to even know it because they're on my block. And because I've had some experience with this working and being involved in government with the city of Brooklyn Park. So it, the crowd, if, if you would open this up, I can guarantee you, as you'll see on Tuesday, you would have much more people here in attendance that are trying, and it's fine. You withdraw the two offers or what have you, and now we're changing the game and doing just the original, is my understanding now. Well, the neighborhood still doesn't want it for all the same reasons that the planner has indicated uh, that she's answered all the questions that were brought up on the two previous dates. They haven't been answered. And they haven't satisfied the public. I appreciate some of the council members at least giving us this opportunity to, again, state our opposition, which was very obvious with even the planning and zoning recommendation to deny it. And that's what you have in front of you. So that's all I got. So again, to, to, to make it clear, uh, Mr. Race on his behalf and on Mr. Stover's and Mr. Stover's behalf, both Mr. Stover's, um, have withdrawn their request for comp plan amendment on the larger parcel and communicated that there still is a request before the council. So those two will go away, but there's still a request before the council on two five-acre parcels for a gas station and liquor store on that corner. And so that will be before the council on Tuesday for a vote. So what happens, my follow-up question to that, so what happens, and we can educate the residents, what happens to that applicant's money that it appears that with those original applications in the ballpark of $1,500 per application, where does that money go? Is that money returned now? Because in dealing with the planner and several amendments, and I printed off the 53 pages in the packet. I mean, it's a tell of, hey, if you don't get this and it's not approved and it all looks like it's not going to get approved, you better withdraw or otherwise you're going to lose out and you can't reapply for a minimum of one year. So where does that money go is my basic question. They had a $1,500 or thereabouts application fee that they said they had to pay. Is that now returned to the Stovers and to Rademacher and Raisler or because they withdrew or? I'll answer your question, Planner okay. Stockman. Thank you. Uh, no, sir. It, they're responsible for all the consultant costs and city costs to date. So they will still get a bill up through today or up through this very last memo at least for me and then there's you know the basic fees that come out of that as well and so, the, the fees the fees that are submitted cover the public hearing cover cover city costs so those costs that were incurred are not going to return it, there's an escrow put in there for any money that isn't expended would be returned above and beyond cost for the planner for the city so there is a, a minimum fee whenever we have to publish and announce, do mailings and things like that. So there is a cost that goes with that that, that we do collect. Accurate? Yeah, so we're all on a pass-through fee system right now. Okay. All right. At this point, we will... Uh, Ask the council to have any other questions amongst ourselves at this point. Um, have something to deliberate. I'm sure you'll be hearing from people between now and then. Um, for those that are watching on YouTube, those in the audience here, the, again, it's, it's a different meeting from the planning and zoning, which was specifically a public hearing. We reiterated at the public hearing that's the time to get up and speak extensively at the in the city council meeting, it is a, a business meeting of the city council. We do a lot for uh, floor items. 
So we, at the beginning of the meeting, uh, after the sheriff's report, uh, we do have a sign-up sheet. We ask people to sign up, uh, uh, tell us what you're going to be talking about, and there will be a limited time. If, if the room is packed like it was previously, we'll, we'll shorten the time. If it's just a few people that want to speak, our standard uh, public uh, forum is three minutes. People get three minutes to speak. Um, the council is not obligated, if you bring up something at a public forum, the council is not obligated to take action that night. But it is a way for the residents to be on record of, of what they think about whatever. And in this case, I would imagine it will be this, this plan. So, so again, it will not, when the council, after the floor items on Tuesday night, when the council discusses, we will not take any more input from the audience at that point. So, so everybody knows the rules going in. It won't, I don't want any surprises on Tuesday. The public forum is, is for vigorous debate and, and interaction. Uh, the council meeting is a business meeting at that point. So. One last thing. That does remind me of one point they wanted to make that uh, I kind of touched on with the planner where she said she answered all the questions. And she actually had Mr. Rademacher bring in a police report, basically a list of how many calls for service. And when I came to the meeting and brought up the point of my experience and wanted the sheriff's input where he didn't provide it and he left, my basic question and what I want for the council to understand is if you put a gas station and butt it up to residential property, from my experience in the 20 years that I worked as a police officer in the city of Brooklyn Park, you're going to have numerous calls, numerous problems, crime, and it's not where you want it, especially in the Southwest. Exactly. And I appreciate that. At this point, it's not new information. I will say that uh, I don't know that the planner had um, Mr. Rademacher uh, bring that information. I do believe he pursued that on his own. I don't know that for sure. I do know that per the question that came up at the, uh, the previous hearing, um, the sheriff actually did do collect data on similar combinations, in fact, by the same owner of a gas station and liquor store in a generally residential area. And uh, they were not there to present any of that information. But I don't know, I, it, unless you talk to Mr. Rademacher, um, that he didn't get that information himself from the sheriff. I'd so, like to clarify, Mr. Mayor. Yes, you may. I did request that information, the public information from the sheriff's office, who provided it to me, and I did share that with the two applicants involved. Okay. And, and, and I don't know that the, the details that Mr. Rademacher shared, I don't know if that was information you had as far as the breakdown of no, he calls. interpolated that, yeah, okay. so himself. Yeah. The sheriff didn't give that information. He didn't break down what the calls were, just how many. Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else that the council needs on that before Tuesday night? Seeing and hearing nothing at this point. Um, I'm going to presume that uh, since the Stover land request was, was uh, withdrawn, that uh, we can go on to... Item C, the encroachment agreement. And did we have anything from A and B Welding? Yeah, have a good night. Do we have anything from A and B Welding on the encroachment? Mr. Mayor. Planner Stockman. I have not heard from the All Wellings since I did this final uh, document. I spoke with Rob Machetta, who was designated to work with me on the, this issue. Spoke with him as late as last or no, no. Uh, well, the day I put this together, so the 31st. Um, and he was agreeable and thought the all wellings would be agreeable to er everything there. We, you know, changed the map and we have the correct reference to the diagram. So as long as um, we condition it upon them combining those lots, then we're fine with the setback arrangement. 
and previous meeting you had said that there was some resistance to combining the lots. Initially there had been, but after I chatted with Mr. Machetta about it and explained that, you know, if the all lines were ever going to put a building addition on, which they had talked about too, that they would need to do the same thing. And then um, we talked about it as somewhat of a trade-off uh, for, you know, them cooperating in that regard and then um, being that the city Excuse me. Had um, if there's going to be side discussions, Mr. Conley, yeah. they'll have to take those outside if there's going to be side discussions. Our speakers do pick it all up. So. Uh, being that the city had approved a fence in previous years when the, um, the first outdoor storage went in, I think it's reasonable to assume that we would allow that as a continuation of that uh, type of fence, and especially given the fact that it's still permitted it as part of our ordinance, those materials. So, um, is that on all sides, north and it west is, as well? That's the only type of fence they have, yeah. No, but I'm saying that, because I noticed, like the concrete business, there's nothing to the north. They've got some something, I don't know, they've finished their... They're fencing there, but it seems like... Oh, he just put his along the street, right? Are you referring to the setback required on all sides? No, I'm, I'm talking about the, the screened fencing. Oh. Some, some other business is going to go north of A and B. Oh, right. Are they required on their north border the fence that they will put up to also be screened, or is that... No, you don't have to screen adjacent to another industrial use. Okay. But, but as far as uh, ferret and... The screening comes on the right-of-way sides, right? So in this situation, it's a little difficult when we have an, the easement along Nowland Boulevard. And um, if Ferret turns out to be their side yard uh, and they're meeting that or matching their current location of their fence, then there's really not a lot of room left on that side. Plus, I think... I mean, an interior street may or may not be a little less significant, but just the fact that it becomes side yard and they, because they do own so many lots, we have to respect that as well. Um, you know, you have the right to request landscaping. I'm talking about the, the um, screening within the fence, the slats, the whatever fence material they put up. Okay. That they would put up along Northern Boulevard. Does that apply to... to Ferret as well, and the fence itself, the slats in the fence between properties. So you're saying there's nothing between properties from industrial to industrial. Right. I would s encourage... I'm not talking about landscaping because we already talked. There's not enough room mm -hmm. if we're going right. to give them those setbacks. Okay, I understand. Yeah, I would encourage the slats on the street sides, the right-of-way sides. But if they don't want to put them on the north side, then they wouldn't be required to per the ordinance. And when somebody eventually builds on that north lot, north of them, mm -hmm. on 201st and now then, they would have to put up some type of screaming, screening if they were going to have a yard of some sort. Right. But there again, they would only be required to do it on Ferret and 201st. But if they did it on 201st, the it would block the view all the way down right. south of them. Correct. Mr. Mayor. How's the record? Yeah, there's no guarantee, though, that that property or whoever buys that property is going to put in a yard, so they may or may not need screening at, at all. Yep. Yeah, just from 201st, you would, you'd be looking down multiple storage yards. And it may be, I don't know what the cost of the slat material is, but it may be all wellings want to screen their material, so. Yeah, maybe they do. All right, anything else on that? Seeing and hearing none, we move on to D. Stockman, you want to 
Bring us up to speed on uh, sure. Mr. Hagelberg. So Mr. Hagelberg is currently in the process of obtaining an IEP for his outdoor storage. And with the comp plan amendment that was on the July planning and zoning agenda, we didn't get to some of the other items. And that has delayed Mr. Hagelberg uh, another month. So his request uh, is to begin putting the fence up for security reasons prior to, I mean, that was always his plan to get the fence up first before he started building and um, get that accomplished before or in anticipation of the IUP approval. Um, certainly he has, is proposing uh, a high quality fence and he has approved the structural part of it. It's an eight foot solid fence. Currently it is um, abutting the 40 foot easement along Iguana and then it's 10 feet from the property line along 201st. So, you know, the fence in and of itself doesn't require any special approvals. Uh, the fact that it's associated with the outdoor storage, um, just want to be sure we're covering our bases in terms of the screening that the city would like to see. Uh, the only real comment I had was that we could possibly move that fence back another five feet or so from 201st property line to leave a little more room for planting of vegetation if the city thought that's what they wanted. Uh, we did have the one property owner come in uh, that lived across 201st. Now if you drive out there, you'll see that there's a cornfield between you know, her house and um, the industrial park. So in reality, I don't know that she could, at this time of year at least, really see that. Um, and the industrial park was there before she moved in. But nonetheless, rescreening is required along 201st. And... The, the property owner came in, is that the people who lived across Cornfield or, or... Yes. ...the horse... She, mm, well, she is a horse family. She's straight, so she's right on the corner of, is it Angan? Tiger? No, Angan and, yeah, 201st. Okay, so there's not a cornfield there. Where there's a house back. Her house her, is set Her back. property, they, they've got the, the riding area and the pasture area between them and 201st, so there's no, there's corn to the east of them. Mueller's? Yeah. Okay. But, but their property is so clear all the way down to 200 and She's open. Oh, okay. Well, so I guess the question is, yeah, we've got an 8-foot fence. The tiny homes are approximately 13 feet or thereabouts. Um, you know, so it's your call. I mean, what, how you want to handle it. Um, do we just leave room for the landscaping and we allow the planning and zoning to figure out what type of landscaping goes in, or what? Obviously a bigger tree like a spruce that may grow higher than the fence is gonna need more room, you know, than something else. So maybe just open it up for discussion or thoughts on the, the matter. The, the, the first thing I see is, is understanding that a number of people that had building desires to build um, were hoping to be in in the July meeting and it got so late that they didn't, and they were continued to August. And in effect, it pushed people back about 45 days from their building. So I think that whatever we can do to accommodate within our guidelines, within the ordinance, within our policy, and we do to accommodate, um, we should do. And so for Mr. Ekelberg to, to have a request, there, there is a risk. You know, I, I assume you own the property at this point? We do own the property, yes. Um, so there is a risk that the IUP would be somewhat more restrictive, but as he wants to get going and has a lot of uh, money tied up into building materials that need to be stored there, I think the security of a fence and the other cameras and things that he was hoping to do uh, seems to make sense. 
there's a risk that the IUP could have an impact. But the fact that the the building inspector has approved the plans, the original request for a 10-foot fence wasn't possible. An 8-foot fence has been deemed appropriate and possible. Um, the idea, I think, originally was to have some landscaping on the north, some trees. Um, got to be a problem with the wetlands. Um, actually ordered the landscape plan two days ago, so... Um, have you seen that, Liz? Uh, I don't even know if I looked at it. I'm sorry. Um, Bless you. Thank you. So, well, so did, where, where does that landscape plan put the fence? Is it the extra five feet that Liz was just talking about? No, so I left, uh, after we discussed it, we, um, I left it at 10 feet. If they want to move in five feet, it's fine. The reason it's at 10 feet is the fence is um, eight feet. It's on center at eight feet all the way, all four sides. So it's about 1,200 feet of fence. And um, that way it's fitting. In the front, there's a 40 foot because of the easement. 15 on the south side, 10 on the north side, and 80 feet on the uh, west side. So we have a row of um, arbor body that will go in on the west side between the fence to the back property. So people can't cut through there on snowmobiles and um, ATVs, um, and then the inside the property, because I can't really put any trees outside where I'd like to on that 40 foot because it's leasement, we're putting in um, three um, different types of evergreens inside the fenced area, and then there'll be another 10 maple trees because of the grass is growing um, in the front corner and in the back corner. Um, the, we have some shrubbery and then we talked alongside that fence if we wanted to in the spring. Uh, we could add um, dogwoods and we could use um, either red or yellow. And the only reason I like to wait to the spring because the place that I would purchase them in Iowa doesn't bear root and they can only do it in March or April. Uh, but those can grow anywhere from 4 to 15 feet depending on what you purchase. So we can cover up the fence if that's a concern. But it's when you think of a fence, our pickets are actually deck boards. So it's a six by six pole post with two by fours, four of them between each of the eight foot sections, and then 18 pickets. So it's a solid fence all the way around. We're not leaving a gap anywhere. Um, and the boards are inch and a um, quarter inch thick. So it's not a uh, fence that you're going to go down and see, and then it's eight foot also. And we couldn't go to 10 because the water table in that area is too high. And the post at that point became over almost 9 by 9s. And um, it was a, the price for that was just kind of astronomical. All right, Council. So again, the, the request is to allow the fence to go up first with planning and zoning still has a continued hearing on this public hearing and would have to establish all the conditions of the IUP. The, the risk to the owner is um, anything that would affect the fencing. But I think with, with the building inspector's approval of the fencing, um, the conditions of the IUP within the fencing uh, are the only open issue at this point, and that's still subject to public hearing. So the question is, would the council have any grave concern at this time regarding the allowance of fencing before the formal IUP is recommended. Mr. Mayor. Councilman um, Raymond. I, I just would like to clarify with Ms. Stockman. The fact, uh, I mean, he, even if he didn't have an IUP in front of the council, he could put up a fence. Correct. So it's not like we're doing anything special, but, you know, it, it, he, he understands the, the issue of the IUP, but it is something that he could come in and recommend, request at any time, so. Yes, um, just to comment, the, the fence in and of itself, especially given its high quality construction, mm -hmm. can be the screening. There really is no landscaping required under the terms of the ordinance, unless, yeah, mm -hmm. planning and zoning specifies. I think the, the, the owner's original thought was to have some, some landscaping 
and the the drainage on the north prevented that. I think it's probably more good neighbor than one more thing, Mr. Hagelberg. Just one thing, the reason that I was told it had to come to council is most fences are six foot, and this will be your first first eight foot fence. And it was required to be engineered. And so that was the only thing. And no, that was I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Didn't mean to interrupt. But and then ironically this morning I was on site with a um, contractor getting a bid and there's actually a stolen car left on property that I had to call the police to have removed. So it does concern me that I'm gonna have tens of thousands of dollars of building materials laying on the ground and um, well, let's not tell everybody how much it's gonna be so. <laughs> <laughs> I'd make some scrap lumber there. A little of no value, but you don't want to lose it. <laughs> no, it'll all be lit and it'll all be camping. Mr. Mayor, just to clarify, the eight-foot fence requires a building permit, not city council approval. So that just kind of a overlap. But we would be providing uh, support to the council to uh, allow them to go ahead prior to the IUP. And Correct. So as Councilmember Rainville says, they're not technically dependent. Correct. All right, council. Anything else, Mr. Mayor? Councilmember Bettinger. So he really doesn't need permission to put the fence up from the council? He doesn't. The concern was just coordinating. Yeah, the, you know, normally I would have said, no, this is associated with the screening, which it goes with the outdoor storage, because otherwise the screening wouldn't even be required. I'll apply for a fence if they're yeah. not storing things there. Yeah. But yeah, realistically, yeah, he could put the fence up if he didn't have outdoor storage. So. But from the council standpoint, he, he will be storing something there while he's waiting for IUP and building to take place. So he will be providing outdoor storage on a temporary basis. So I think it's it's appropriate for the council to to weigh in and say, I think it's an okay idea or wait until you get your IUP and all the T's are dotted and are crossed and I's are dotted. So really what we're approving is temporary storage until he gets his IUP. Mm -hmm. yep. with a fence around it. Any other questions or concerns? All right, no grave concerns, we'll vote on Tuesday. Same place, same time. Enforcement updates. I'm stocking anything you want to bring to our attention. A lot of yellow here. A lot of action. We got a lot of things updated. Um, eliminated three of three additional sites from our list. Um, the only thing I think I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, I did leave the um, Scott Halderson property, 18560 Cleary Road, on the list, even though when I inspected last week, uh, his burn pile was legal um, and did include brush and some pallets. Um, I did not see any unlicensed or inoperable vehicles that day. Um, there were semi, several semi-trucks, um, but... We've been aware of that previously, so I just um, want to, I guess, keep it on there so I can check a couple more times in the next month and then see if there's any other thoughts on the matter. You know, some of you are in the vicinity more than I am, so. So is he put back on because of a new complaint or because I thought we had asked him to be removed because he was in compliance? Well, we did bring it up, what, two months ago? And then we we did get a new complaint. Um, and the, I think the, you know, typically has had the burn pile going. We don't want it to include junk. It, it did not include any junk when I last looked at it. 
if it's legal, you know, um, brush and whatnot, that he's getting off his property and, um, you know, he gets approval before he starts the fire, that's fine. So, like I said, I didn't see any really uh, glaring violations last week. How big is the pile? Well, it's big. I mean, it's at least 20 by 20, maybe, you know, I would say it's... And, and what is our, our legal burn with a permit? I think, do you go 15 by 15? Yeah. So, I guess one, yeah. of, the, one of the questions that's come up before is, um, the understanding is they typically burn in October. Right. So they kind of build up all year. But if you're saying we're already beyond the size limit of a permit and he's still got three months to to pile well he gets special approval though to do that i mean the inspector comes out and looks at his pile and he's done it in the past so you know i guess it's sort of a catch-22 situation and i'm not the question is would we want multiple residents to have 20 by 20 or bigger if he's mm -hmm. adding pallets and things for the next right. few months. Yeah, at what point it, do you say that the reason it's 15 by 15 is much more controllable? I would think mm -hmm. from a fire standpoint, you, you want to make sure it's not a windy day. If you're Maybe. The size of a small garage. Well, Mr. Mayor, you're, you're, you're speculating too. You're, you're assuming right now that what he's got in that pile, he's going to light all up in one and we don't know that. He could have everything piled up in one and then, you know, make smaller piles that when he burns. We I'm, burn. I'm speculating based on history. Well, I understand that, but again, I'm just saying. I mean, typically, it's a bonfire in the fall, so. But if he, and again, if he is going through the proper steps to, you know, get the approvals to do that, you know, to me, I don't understand why he, he's on here, to tell you the truth. It just seems... You know, well, I think by there's certain individuals that, with na not naming names, that have issues, and I, I see other ones on here that have had zero action whatsoever, but yet we never talk about those. But this poor guy, every chance we get, he was just in the other month, you know, trying to let us know what he's doing, you know, keep us informed, trying to work with us, but yet he keeps showing up on here, and there's other ones that have been on here for months that we never hear anything or talk about. Oh, I think and that opinion, by, by yeah. his own estimate, by his own statement when he was in here, he did agree there were things that can't be burned in there that his son was pulling out to build forts and stuff with. But if those were left in there, yes, the inspector, I don't think, would allow it to be burned. And Mr. Mayor, correct me if I'm wrong, but before he gets his permit, somebody goes out and looks at the pile. That's my understanding. Okay, so then, again, that's not our job to do, and that therefore should not put him on here. If he has to go through a certain process... When he gets his permit, he should be able to do that. And if he's doing that, then why are we talking about it? Well, again, we're, we're complaint-driven at this point. Um, and, and my point, why does he keep coming up on here for, in my opinion, things that aren't really a complaint? This isn't a complaint to me. If he's got a pile there that's ready to burn, if he's following all the right steps to do what he's got to do, why is there a complaint? Why are there other complaints on here that we haven't talked about in months that we that again are in my opinion way above and beyond this in my opinion we're singling out one person and i don't think that's right um again i was asking the planner what was important on her to summarize what we've seen and we've seen a lot of yellow what's the important one so and again who brought it to her and why is it even on the list mr mayor councilman raymond um paul i will, will admit i i did um, uh, file that complaint because I had numerous residents contacting me. And as an elected official, it's my job to bring that forward. So, I mean, I'm not going to tell people I'm not going to. So. Mr. Mayor, I have a question for Councilmember Rickard. Um, I know that the state statute allows a 20 by 20 pile, and I agree. I mean, if 
Mr. Halverson were to split that pile up, he, you know, he could certainly be legal. I haven't measured the pile. I mean, it looks gigantic to me from the road, but nonetheless, um, the contents were legal. Um, he's, he's always handled it in the past. So yeah, why, he's great, why, right, why right. Her, I, I feel we're harassing him. Just, he went out there and he wasn't in violation of everything, but yet we want to keep him on the list and keep checking on him. Leave the guy alone. We well, move he, out here to be left alone. And as long as we're a law-abiding citizens, leave us alone. He did clean it up, which is which is what we wanted. He did take the unlawful items out of the pile. So, I mean, to me, that was the biggest thing. All right. Any other thing on your list that uh, you want to bring to our attention? No, sir. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Um, to Ms. Stockman, mm -hmm. um, looking at one that I believe has been resolved, which is the 19677 Jasper, the third one down. Has that not been resolved and can go down? To yeah, the I almost took that off of there, but I wanted to double check the. Uh, we had him back when we revised that list of IUP conditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I did just want to kind of go through those with okay. him right. before I took them off. Yeah, I do think he's, I know that, you know, the Quonset was removed and some of the bigger things. Yeah. yeah. And I have one other question. Uh, on uh, 199.33 West Fordbrook, mm -hmm. um, given the, t given most of what's there, um, has there been any contact with the sheriff's office to have them um, go by and? Yeah, I know the complainant has called the sheriff. Okay, so I they're aware of this. Okay. Yeah, they're aware right. of it. Because mm -hmm. most of that is law enforcement. Correct. Anybody else? Seeing and hearing nothing. We'll move on. Had a chance to look through the uh, audited claims. Anything from the workshop, the meeting minutes? Anybody's had a chance to look through them all? I haven't looked through the audited claims yet. Uh, proclamation, RCA. I'm sorry, Benji, you want to say anything about the budget on the Upper Rum River? Uh, no, we did the best we did to keep it as low as we can. So, um, if we let Bowser have their way, it'd probably be two or three times what we got. So, but our our plan has not been approved yet. So, keep that in mind. We have the uh, recycling center addition. Mayor, um, I know I've had discussions before on this. Um, I've had conversations with um, Sue Dahl at the county in regards to the grant that we were awarded and the ability that we would have to use those funds in a method other than doing an addition to the building. And as she was, she stated that as long as the purpose of the expenditures are used um, to work towards increasing our productivity and the type of material we take, um, that she didn't see any difficulties in doing making that change to how we would use the grant funds. She did say that there were other cities that have have done that, and and that's been approved. Um, the only real stipulation is that we do spend by the end of the year. Um, but she didn't see any problem with using those funds to, to better the building. Um, so going forward, um, any changes um, would be, um, we'd have a better handle on them uh, if we did some addition, addition to the building at a later time. Um, I had submitted the list of things that um, I came up with and Council Member Brian had sent me and Don Warden had sent me um, the things that we could use that, that funding for um, to help us um, 
better utilize that facility. Um, and so I would I would look for council's approval instead of um, going out and um, contracting with um, the company to to do the addition that we um, look at making some um, other changes to the facility first. Um, also, one of the things that Sue told me is we can use the funds to um, hire employees to work in the building, which would help us also with illegal dumps, um, people taking things from the recycle center um, and just keeping it uh, cleaner. Um. Mr. Mayor. Senator Benger. So when you talk to Sue Dollar, you're talking about the full 80,000 or you're talking about just the 30,000 that we get every, every no, year? No, the, 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 the dollar amount of the grant, the 50. Now, I think the other 30,000 is a grant too that we could lose. That we have to spend in recycling. And that's what we spent last year. We were trying to spend and we didn't get it all spent. The 50,000, I think, is for the building only. You can't use it for employees and other things. It's, 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 it's for that specific thing. Well, that, that isn't what I heard from Sue because I talked to her about the $50,000 grant that we were awarded for the addition to the building. Well, I think, um, better check because I think they're both grants. And one you can, and I bet you the 50000 you can't. So we, we was, and if that's the case, we're going to lose, by not building that addition, we're going to lose over $50,000 that, that could be used toward the city, the recycling center. And the recycling center isn't big enough. We're using another shop down here. It's not efficient. They're hauling materials down here all the time. Batteries, cams, uh, light bulbs. We have stuff sitting outside down there in the building between the recycling center and the fire department. Mm -hmm. We need an addition to clean, make that place stay cleaner, more efficient. And also, the goal was to add on more materials to be brought in to become a full service recycling center. Council Member Bettinger, we are a full service facility at this time. We would just be adding to um, the products that we accept, but we are a full service. The county considers us a full service. I can go back to Sue and ask her again, but I, you know, I specifically specifically talked to her um, about the grant um, that was for the construction of the of the building. Um, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Rickert. Obviously we have two across council actions, one submitted by Corey and one by Mary. Mm -hmm. I agree with Councilman Bettinger. If, if you look at your list, there's no way we're gonna even come close to, 50. basically you're putting signage up, which we have signage up all over, which nobody really pays attention to anyway. Um, I agree, we, got, we have an opportunity. We have $50,000 sitting in front of us by the county. We budgeted the, the other, most of the other funds to do the addition. I think we're foolish not to accept that and do the addition. I agree that we do need to work out some details as far as how we store stuff, who's going to run it, things like that. But I, again, those are things that once we get a structure and get things set up how we want to, that's things we deal with then. You know, we've gotten additional grants and I agree I think they're two separate grants but you know if, if that other grant does allow us to hire staff then we so be it or we hire a seasonal person to do it you know but again I think if, if there's coordination between the correctional people who come and work there during the day and there's somebody to kind of watch them a lot more would get done I see them over there all the time doing virtually nothing if we had somebody who was available to be there some of the hours that they're there, again, I think a lot would get more, would be able to get done. And right now, if you go in there, it, it is cramped and crowded and we don't have a lot of space. But again, we have the funds. We budgeted for funds. We got a grant from the county. I think we're foolish if we don't use it that way. Mr. Mayor. Councilman Bryan. I would say there's certainly room. For, I would say at this time we can't necessarily look to expand on what we're currently doing until we get what's we're currently recycling under control and yes we've had 
issues with because we've got the um, we're storing the materials in several different places. There's and it's not convenient to get the roll offs out of there because of the way that they're oriented. Um, and yes, we could do uh, we could do sorting more sorting by resorting milk jugs and that kind of thing. But I think part of it too is we need to look at a way to organize the space we do have. And if that includes expanding to, to it, because I don't think, you know, otherwise to rearrange the, the openings, we're going to, you know, that's going to involve, you know, re-architecting the whole thing just by doing part of it. So it certainly would be worth looking into to, at least take what we can take what we have, reorganize it if needed, consolidate things together to make it more efficient, and then move forward. Because as I understood it, we didn't have to take, you know, we didn't have to expand any, expand into taking more things, just because we've, just because we've added on to the recycling center. Council Member, um, <coughs> Mr. Mayor. Council Member Brian. Uh, Council Member Brian. Um, as the grant was originally uh, written, we were going to increase the items we were going to take, the type of items, with the um, addition that would allow us to do that. But I agree with you, we can't handle what we have now. We don't know, we don't know ours, we don't know who's doing what, we don't know anything. And I think that we need to get a handle on that first. Um, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Rickert. So two things. We did state that we were going to accept additional items. There's no timeline on when we have to do that, number one. Number two, by putting the addition on that we have the funds, a huge portion of those funds are coming from a grant from the county. Mm -hmm. How is that hurting us in any way from getting organized on how we can do things now? Seems to me it'd be beneficial because we have more space to do what we want to do in it. Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Pettinger. I agree with Councilman uh, Paul. There's no way to get organized. We can't fit. There's a, there's a roll off down in this building. We can't fit another roll off there. There's no way you're going to get that organized and get everything to fit in there. And you can't be mixing the materials together. They're, they, they each have their own container, each roll off. And if you want to, to clean it up and make it look nicer, you put that addition on. That's why we that's why we started that conversation a few years ago for that addition was to get organized, get it cleaned up, get it so it's functional, get it so we're probably in violation of our own ordinance. We all that stuff stored outside; it's not even screened. Is to get that stuff so it's screened. It's behind the fence or it's inside the building. We're talking about someday allowing an addition to be put in the fire department. There really isn't room with that stuff being stored out there. We got a grant that's going to pay for that addition that will allow us to get more organized. And we still have the grant that we can st put more staff hours toward cleaning up. I think the maintenance guys are doing it now. I've been over there and it looks way better. They've been, been doing a really good job. So I think there's a little bit of misinformation going on here. I mean, for, for a while there, uh, for some reason, I think Don wasn't showing up, maybe health problems, whatever. but. It's being taken care of, and we have money to, to put staff to it if we want to get it, to see that it does continue to be taken care of. But we need to get it organized. We need to get it set up so it can be organized. That's a shame because this is the second time we awarded this grant, and if we don't use it this time, I think that that's going to be looked at the next time we try to apply for it to put on another edition. Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Brown. To Councilmember Bettinger, um, I'm, maybe I didn't say it how I intended it, but I'm not saying where we don't expand. There, I'm saying we, there are things that Don identified that could be done that I think would take, be taken care of with that expansion without having to expand what we're taking. By, by we can organize what we have. It's 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 upsetting when you see the cardboard coming out the door, um, because it just happened to be the weekend that everybody decided to drop off the cardboard. 
not that we don't have the staff time to go do it, but everybody just dropped it off and it decided to, pop, to pile up over and over again. So it would be worth, I would be, it'd be worth discussing that expansion just so that there's more space for what we do have. My understanding was though, to, the grant was so that we could take on more. The grant was so we would take on carpeting, uh, limited furniture, or mattresses, I guess. Mattresses, mattresses and carpeting, and, and we would expand it, which we don't. We, we bought a container for mattresses. I think it's still over in the, the maintenance yard. I don't know if we've ever used it for anything. Um, so the idea was to consolidate, as it's been said, under one roof um, in an organized fashion, locking down which that which needs to be locked down, setting up the appropriate bins so people could store more neatly, giving people an opportunity to do better. And then, obviously, the questions come up maintaining it. It's, I don't know that it's necessarily. I do know that, that uh, certain stores bring their cardboard down here. Uh, St. Francis people bring it down here because they can recycle for free here. And when it comes in, it's a load. But in, in some cases, it's, you know, there, there are still messes to be cleaned up. You know, the question is, if, if we're going to expand to carpeting and mattresses as part of our acceptance of this fund, of this grant, we need to be able to handle that because we somebody's going to handle the bigger materials. So I, I can understand the argument that let's get control of what we have. Um, I don't know if this is $50,000 worth of, of growth here, and I think it needs to be clarified if... The $50,000 grant can be used for anything but expansion of the building. What I'm hearing you say is you think Sue Dahl said that, but I, I would like to see that in writing if that's the case. Um, and if we didn't use it the previous year because last year the money we got for it, I'm not sure if it was $50,000 or what it was, but the quote that came in was so far beyond that we didn't have any other funds to put with it to, to pull it off last year. Um, that's why we came in knowing it would be more this year and they gave us $50,000. And we've got the 30000 that we use to run the recycling center on a regular basis. So we, we didn't use it all last year, uh, knowing that you know, we had a discussion last budget cycle. We should be ready with a backup plan if we, can't, if we can't do the building. What else needs to be done there that we could spend the money on that if we don't have the money this year would be future years. We ended up with the floor sweeper out of it and not much more. So I do think it, it takes a plan going in. If it's a moot point, if that money can only be used for the building, then this other RCA isn't, isn't, um, is applicable. Can I just make one comment? If, if um, Councilmember Rainville is stating that she had talked to Sue, and Sue said that that $50,000 could be used other than the addition, then it doesn't make a difference if you put the addition on because you're not expanding the use then if you use the money for other things. Yeah, that's, you know, again, I think that's important to clarify mm -hmm. because when we first got the grant, it had to be to be a full service and expand what we're doing. And I don't know if there's other things that are considered expansion. You know, are there other materials we don't currently take that other groups are recycling that maybe we don't have to go into all of the uh, carpeting and mattresses and furniture and, you know, what else is being recycled that we aren't recycling. Right. Mr. Um, Mayor. Council Member Bettinger. Just to clarify, we, we are taking mattresses. They do store mattresses in a container that we bought, which is another container that should be in that building that's being stored over in the maintenance yard. But if, when mattresses come in, they do haul them over there and put them in that container. Uh, are people paying for those or are they just being dropped here? That I don't know. I know. I Mm -hmm. So if somebody drops it here, we we store it over there for now. Okay, Mr. Mayor, Council Member, and again, we don't have a set timetable. That our our goal has been to you know start taking more and more. But by accepting the grant, there was no condition or no timetable on when we had to start doing that. I think to be considered full time though is is anybody staffing it on the first Saturdays? Mm -hmm. so. yeah, Steve's been going. Steve's been going. I can say because that was one of our requirements is that we are open at least once a, once a month on Saturday. So. And again, I, I don't think until we actually have what we want and can organize ourselves, there's no real way to figure out exactly how 
we want it to run and be efficient. All right, anything else on this? I think everybody's made their positions known. Any other information that we need? So, Council Member Rainville, if, if you have time and want to clarify what the grant can be used for and, and get that to Corey, mm -hmm. and she can get it to the Council before Tuesday. Mr. Mayor, I, I do believe that um, Sue is out of the office until Wednesday, my last conversation with her. So I don't know if I would have that information by then. So it would be whatever the council votes on Tuesday. Is there anybody that covers for her when she's there? She didn't tell me that there was anybody. I don't know that anybody else has made that decision. That's what So we will just go with what council decides on Tuesday. All right, consent agenda continued. Accept withdrawal of conditional use permit for application grant Rademacher <coughs> for expansion of the uh, high speed fuel pumps at the uh, 5 and 22 intersection. It's unfortunate, but that. Uh, mm -hmm. Apparently got too expensive, and so uh, I believe that he will still be putting hundreds of thousands of dollars into curbing and, and uh, landscaping and improvements, but there will be no drainage pond, there will be no Great. fuel pumps. Have we got any questions on that? An RCA here that uh, Corey put in for the approval for Chief Corner to keep his eyes open for a fire fire vehicle. At this point, it's not to exceed fifty thousand dollars with the consent of the mayor and or city clerk. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Bryant, just. Just a thought. I understand. We we all agreed we need to look at it. But was that fifty thousand include? If it was, you know, if it was found in Texas, does that include transportation to get it up here? I guess we never really talked about it. We said that the money was there, but we never went into how to get it up here if it wasn't local. What do you consider local? <laughs> well. Okay, transportation I'll just, just costs. say delivery costs. Yeah, delivery yeah. costs. Because I know the engine we drove to South Dakota and brought back. Mm -hmm. No, what's that? Did, did uh, Chief Coner think that 50000 was reasonable? Um, Mr. Mayor, the only reason I put this RCA, because Lori had mentioned that you guys talked about it at the budget mm -hmm. meeting. And I think he thought that 50000 I'm assuming, was reasonable. Um, you'd be better to answer that than me because I don't have that meeting. Well, can we get a more realistic number from him by Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Should be able to. Mr. Mayor? Council Member Rainville. Um, in transportation costs, if, you know, I mean, so, so Council Member Rickard, did you have two firefighters, one, both of you drove out in one vehicle, and then you brought the second, brought the two back, or? We actually had five of us, I think, that went out. Okay. Um, I mean, and, and somebody mentioned Texas. I mean, depending on where, I mean, a one-way flight for two people. I mean, for, I, you, that vehicle is, there's more involved in, than what this would be. I mean, would you believe that two people could drive this back, or even one person, depending on the distance? Ideally, um, I think you'd want minimum of two, two. obviously, yeah, okay. just for safety um, issues and yeah. whatnot. But um, so, it, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me. So, maximum, you know, if you have two one-way tickets to some place and maybe an <coughs> overnight in a hotel room, that shouldn't be that much expense. I mean, even in seven hundred dollars, two hundred, you know, three fifty a piece for a. One way ticket of some sort. Yeah, because when we bought the blue truck, mm -hmm. oh. that was, they were flown down. Yeah. Um, Joe In and Florida, uh, right? Don, and they drove actually straight through. Through. I can't remember which state it was in. Was it Florida? Yeah. Florida, yeah. 
So, I mean, I think that, I mean, that check with Chief, but did 50 with, I would say, under $1,000 in transportation costs, depending on where it's at. That should not be, should be doable. Yes. Yeah. 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 MPCA would say not a plane, but it'll take the bus. Well, take Amtrak for that. I but I mean, I think depending that, where it is, they, they yeah. recommend the train or the bus. But, yeah. But if you got to take a train to Texas, that's a long route. That's a route. long drive. <laughs> got to go to the coast first. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I would think that. All right. If we guess. So at this point, thousand. we'll have uh, Corey confirm with Chief Coner mm -hmm. that uh, fifty thousand, and we can uh, discuss potential delivery costs. But mm -hmm. anything else on the on the rescue truck? No. And again, the money's. In the, in the capital equipment fund for that right now. So if they find a good truck, uh, we can move quickly. Everybody's invited to the opening of the uh, state capital. Encourage residents, elected officials to come and be part of it the weekend of the uh, 11th, 12th, and 13th. We have a request from a resident, Clayton Conley. Mr. Mayor. Council Member Ringo. I, I would suggest that we make a motion that we direct uh, City Clerk to contact the Anoka Sheriff's Office to conduct the commercial vehicle enforcement extra patrol as requested by the uh, resident and move this to the consent agenda. Have you got a problem with that? I, I think it forward information to the sheriff's department, right. but not to tell them they have to do it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's yeah. a cost. Yeah. And, 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 and actually... And 181st is actually half Ramsey. It's not even all in all. Then. These, and this, the traffic counts that he has on, that are recorded on here are twice what they really are. I, I would correct that to... Um, for the we would council would direct the city clerk to contact the Anoka County Sheriff's Office and the Ramsey Police Department um, to request commercial uh, vehicle enforcement and extra patrol at both of the intersections per a request from our resident. No reaction. And then to move it to consent. So are we okay with moving that to consent as presented? Pre-evaluation of current distribution method of city new distribution and method of city newsletter. Mr. Mayor. That's what I'm right. Um, just looking at uh, and talking to, to residents and looking at how we currently distribute the newsletter, I just wanted to at least bring it bring it to council for discussion. Uh, currently, if we're mailing out 1,500 copies of our newsletter, it costs a $1,500 for printing and postage per newsletter, and that's not including staff time to, it takes to put the labels on for the mailing. Uh, currently, everyone, as I understand it, after talking to Corey and Lori, everyone in the office and from the maintenance department kind of pitches in to put the labels on everything. When they're when they get out to get them printed, um, just to open it up to look at the possibility to um, change the distribution of the newsletter uh, by distributing it uh, more electronically, where it can be emailed out or uh, just put on the website. Um, there could be copies available at the city office to to gather. Uh, it was um, suggested by. Uh, Corey and Lori that um, it would just be put out put on the uh, website and copies be available at the uh, city office we could put an article in the fall newsletter this year kind of stating how things would be different uh, going forward and we could even look at you know sending out an email to the current distribution list to say hey here's where the newsletter is and um, to go from there how many people on the current distribution list? Oh, on the email list? I don't know. 4,500 uh, residents? But then you don't count the residents, you count households. Yeah, 1,500 households.
Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Rainville. Councilmember Bryan. Um, I, I, I would like to see us do a different type of a newsletter. Um, I understand your thought of saving money by, by doing it electronically, uh, but there are other cities that contract with public, public, pub, publishing houses that do all of the legwork to, to produce a uh, publication. They sell ads um, in it. They take care of everything. They make a profit out of it. Um, but it's still a benefit to our residents. They're getting a better, uh, a better newsletter, more information, um, that's more professional looking, and um, it wouldn't cost us anything. It's, it's up to that publisher to make sure that they sell enough ads and have enough information in there that it's not going out as a, at a loss, because their job is to make money on it. Um, I used to have a stack of ones from different cities. I'll see if I can still find those in my cupboard. Um, but rather than do the website, um, I know we're trying to direct things to the website, um, but that's something you talk to people, and you know they keep that all year long, or half a year till the new one comes out. Um, and I think we could maybe provide a better product um, if we contract that out, and then that all of that staff time would be freed up because it would be the publishing house that would be responsible for doing all the work. Council Member Rainville, mm -hmm. um, I don't totally agree with it because the publishing company has to get the data somewhere, which would be the staff that would be supplying them with the data that we want in there. Mm -hmm. So there's still, it's not like they're going to be calling people in our community and asking them for articles and stuff. And to Ms. Leducer, you are correct. There will still be staff time, but it would not. You wouldn't have to design it, and I mean that takes a long time. Yeah. And um, the labeling and the mailing and all of that, that is taken care of um, by the publishing house. Yeah. And I, I, it might be beneficial to check with some other because I know when Lori went to the clerk's orientation, that's where she also got some information that there's a lot of communities that quit doing their newsletter okay. because it just wasn't beneficial for them. I don't even think Andover does one anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's just that cities are just going away from that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like it's completely up to you guys what you want to do with that. All the millennials are going electronic. All the pardon? The millennials. Yeah. Everybody wants electronic now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but most of our residents aren't that That's racket, so. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Brian. That's basically where the discussion came in to, you know, it, we couldn't, you know, there's there's different generations and, and different mechanisms that have to be, you know, it, it's worth investigating for how the different generations want to do it. I guess the question is, before we spend the time and effort looking, working on the newsletters going forward, if we're going to make a change, we need, we need to Put, we need to say something about how we're going to change it in that September newsletter. So I know there's a lot of people that said, I don't, you know, I get it in the mail. Oh, you sent it to me? Because they probably didn't even notice it and it went right in the recycle bin. Mm -hmm. And they would rather get it online or just, you know, where they can either have it emailed or they go know what's on the website and they can, can look at it there if they need it for reference. So, yes, there is a different clientele where some people want it and other people yeah. don't. And given that we put a coupon for recycling in there and we, add, we maybe get three coupons a year, people just are not reading it or reading it thoroughly enough to see that there's a coupon for $2 off recycling. I was surprised at how many people did bring them in. You know, they, we let them use them for something. I think it was just for appliances last time. But yeah. Mm -hmm. But the fact that half a dozen brought it in, we gave it to them. I was surprised because the people that that actually were coming to recycling, some of them had planned enough to say, I'm going to recycling and I have a coupon. Yeah. Or shoot, I forgot it. <laughs> I heard that a lot. I mean, it, it is we could, already we could put them in the recycling bin and there's some people there that would find those That's coupons. That's true. That's true. And it is on the website already. I mean, that, that, and it's always been, Corey's always posted that on the website. So it is already there. 
You could always have people sign up for it if they want a paper copy and then mail it to them. That was an option. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of um, the mailing labels are now in a spreadsheet where we could, that kind of thing could be uh, tracked if, if that's what we want to do. And then again, it comes to, you know, these so many people want it emailed, so many people want it mailed, so many people on the website. Where, how, how far do we want to go with it? <coughs> that was one of the suggestions that Lori, when she came back from her uh, class, was that pick, pick two options and go with them. Well, I guess the biggest thing would be, you know, is there w some way that we can figure out, you know, if, if we're going through all this effort and staff's putting all this much time, you know, are people even reading it? So, yeah, do you, in the September one, do you put something in there, if, you know, if you want one, please do this and then see, see what happens that next time we print it. And if you don't get any response from anybody or very few actually say, yeah, send me one. Then maybe we decide at that point. Yeah, it's we got ten people looking at it. It's not worth staff time to put together. Yeah, I think that that you have to have the full context too. I would guess that in the, the conference that Lori was at, you're talking about cities that have their own Facebook, have have much better web presence than we do. They have people that are hired to do those things, um, to keep up the electronic content, to keep it current. Um, you know, many of the cities, when I go to the websites, they do have multiple um, electronic communication available. And while there certainly is a greater percentage of, of millennials in, in cities other than ours, that, that is the, the means of communicating, the cities also have a lot more invested in maintaining that. The content's going to be the same. It's still going to be up to city staff and and, and council members and, and the like to provide the content, whether it's electronic or hard copy. That part's not going to change. The fact that the hard copy being produced in the city offices, and and we have many residents that volunteer to to you know put on mailing labels and help out with the, the newsletter. So we do have additional resources available. I think it's been a lot more convenient to just have staff do it, bring people that are familiar with the office and come in and do it together. But, but I, um, well, I can I can see the reason why we haven't had the volunteers so much is because of the coordination. When we're printing them, we're slapping on the labels right now. In order for us to print all of them to bring in and coordinate the people, we would have to have them all printed, and that takes about three days to print them all. So it's just as convenient for us to, as they're printing, to just be slapping on the labels instead of printing them all and then hopes that we can get some people to come in. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't disagree. I'm just saying that, that part of that understanding is it's, it's more convenient to do it that way than the staff has to do this. And um, I think, to Mary's point, that if there were a higher quality newsletter that, that actually people held on to, ours may look like something that they don't need to hang on to, as opposed to you take a look at Ramsey's with full color photos and ads and coupons. Um, when I talked to their publisher at one point, they were making a fair amount of money on it. Uh, but their staff simply had to provide the content, the articles, and the publisher did the, the artwork and the uh, ads, you know, went out and, and they got paid for the ads, which covered the cost of the mailing. But I think it's certainly something worth investigating. We can we can put a, a comment in there. And we can find out. Maybe there are the majority of people who prefer to have it electronically. And then we should be putting in resources so we can do a good job electronically. But I think we need to realize that in cities that may be dropping them, in, in context, they may be dropping them because they have much more robust electronic support to handle website and Facebook and and Twitter and everything else. So, if you go to Minneapolis, they got whole departments doing it. So. And in Minneapolis, you're going to see a lot more people that are only getting their, their information electronically. So. Out here, we don't even have cable. So. 
hopefully by the end of September, at least they can get electronically out here. I mean, that's been one of the whole drawbacks. The majority of the city didn't have access to it. It's electronic, so. Anything else on this before uh, Tuesday? Who's ball court? Councilman Rainbow. Mr. Mayor, um, I, I brought this forward based on um, uh, calls I got from residents who had seen the installation of the foosball court. And, um, I, you know, I, I, I can't judge what anyone else um, feels is acceptable or not, um, but the residents that called me did not feel that this was acceptable. Um, the installation of the how the concrete poles were, how the concrete was installed, um, the condition of the poles, um, and so I, you know, as a council, I, I don't know if this is acceptable to the remainder of the council. Um, I, I don't know. I, I I just don't think this is um, in its current stage. Uh, it's the quality of an amenity we want to provide to our residents. Uh, um, there's already, the last I looked, there were already two poles um, off of the, you know, the crossbars were already off. I don't know if those, they were taken down, um, if they were broken off. Um, the one time it was just laying on the ground and that's in one of the pictures. I, I'm thinking if staff took them off, they would have put them away. Oh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know council member spot, so. My understanding is the the length, the width of the court, had something to do with the confusion that the, the staff did their research by going online and found 14 foot wide courts and uh, therefore cut the poles to a 14-foot width. Uh, Mr. Williams had designed with 21 feet in mind, and therefore the poles were 21 feet, if I'm understanding right. And so they needed to be welded back together to reach all the way across. Um, my understanding is the poles would be replaced with solid, non-welded poles. The question is, at 21 feet, are they going to sag when kids climb and hang on them? The, the research online was that it might be more common to have 14-foot lengths. We have Dan and Joe in the back if uh, council would like to inquire if I'm getting my facts right. So part of it was the, the discussion and debate on the width, and, and, and again, we, we went into a project without knowing the details, and we asked staff to flush it out, and, and they did their best. and. There were some discrepancies on it. So in an attempt to, to put it back, um, the welds aren't going to be sufficient for the PVC uh, to slide over. Council the first. The welds don't hold nothing. They got couples in there, the little pipes together to make it 21 feet. The welds ain't nothing. They just put it on there so we had something drain on to soak it. So it PVC with nickel copper. The wheels don't do nothing. They're just going for a ride. They're not holding nothing. Williams. Uh, <coughs> this was the same design that we used for the Heritage Festival two years ago. And we got, and I was there personally from South to South now when it was there, and not one person complained about the condition of the poles. Uh, and we had the poles and we had the dusty egg. Everybody just came with play. I'm part of that culture down there. I bike and I, and I, I walk that park. I bike down there. I teach kids how to play chess and checkers down there. I play with the dog people. I've shown 50 or 100 people this and nobody said, oh, it's like, oh, this won't work. They want to play. Last Sunday, I had 53 people down there because a month ago, I tentatively said we're going to start a foosball league this Sunday and it showed up. There was no, uh, it wasn't ready, so I had to go home and get a rare rubber ball, and they played kickball on Ernie Kohler field instead. Um, the reason, uh, Ron originally was going to do, from work well, originally was going to weld the poles together or put them together just like he did for the Heritage Festival, but he was 
really busy. And so Joe went down there, Joe and I went down there to get him, and he went to do it at the truck, at the shop. We had a com communication breakdown, so they got cut 15 instead of 21. So um, the fence is already 25 by 45 to fit the poles. Uh, so Joe and we're back together. You know, we have more poles down. We have an indefinite pride. We have a whole trailer load of poles down there. Plan one um, was to put, um, there's another pole inside the pole for structure, but made it a little bit heavier. So next time we won't put the pole in there. We, that's plan B. We have plan C, use half inch rebar, which they're eight bucks a piece for 20 foot lengths at the uh, Home Depot in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Park or Brooklyn Center. Uh, all, all the cross motor police does is really is for some, give the plastic something to slide on. You know, uh, and that will be a lot lighter than the heavier poles. But um, I mean, this is this kind of a prototype. That's why it's designed that you can take apart the side, the, the top horizontal pieces independently, or the vertical ones independently. So if it's vandalized or needs a repair, that's why it's done that way. But the whole thing can be put together without a well. Um, then the, there was a hold up. I don't know who stopped the hold up on fencing, but the fence has nothing to do with the, the poles because um, no matter if the fence is up, that there's an eight foot gap on either end so Joe can get the skid loader in there to lift the poles out, lift the whole, bolt the whole things out at once. It was designed that way. The goal, the backstop is eight feet back so you can get the skid loader on there. I mean, we thought this out. Uh, we have plan A, plan B, plan C. Um, we just need, uh, you know, and they can be sanded down and put rust over there if that's a complaint, but you hold on to the plastic. You know, uh, nobody complained after the heritage festival where most of the people are dressed up uh, that they got uh, anything on them, uh, rust, dirt, or anything. It was a fly. The heritage festival people thought it was a good enough idea that they wanted us to, re to replicate or do it again the next year, but nobody in Park and Rec wanted to do it, so it can't be that bad. So I would just like the opportunity so for us to go ahead and reorder the fence and hopefully get it done by um, um, uh, Labor Day. So I can get this, these football, these foosball league, leagues going. Uh, nobody that I see down there saying, hey, it's an eyesore, hey, we don't like the way you look. The concrete at the bottom is calling for weed, weed control. Um, the people that uh, were allegedly complaining about this aren't part of that fault. Part, 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 part. They're not going to burn a calorie around their unit. You just can't go look, oh, it's not good, let's get rid of it. I mean, I got almost two years of uh, invested in this thing. Um, this was going long before you came aboard, Mary. We were, we were involved with that, Paul and Chris and I, Judy and I. Um, you can't, can't say, oh, I don't like it, let's get rid of it. And then you told me you would like to rebid the steel. The price for that steel at Menards, which is arguably the cheapest place in town, is 1800 bucks. You know, uh, so we got this steel for free. So we just need to make it work. But like I said, I want to reiterate, the fence has nothing to do with the, uh, the six poles in there. The fence can go up, but we can work out the pole situation. Hey, right, council have anything to... Mr. Mayor. Council Mayor Rickard. Two things, I guess. Number one is, I have a question for Councilman Rainville. You know, it's, we, tr we continually try to say that we work together, but yet you're gonna bring an RCA to the council and did you contact staff on, on this and g get an opinion or get, talk to Joe and ask him, you know, to get some of your answers. Okay, yeah, and actually it's in the packet. On July 5th, I sent the following email. Mayor Corey, Lori, Lori, Joe. Okay, and can I interrupt one minute? Sure. And the question is, okay, on May fifth, where is the rest of the council members in that email? You're communicating to the mayor, staff, and the park and rec chair. Where's the where's the rest of the committee and where's the rest of the council? I neglected to put them in there. Apologize, uh, <laughs> but no one other than the mayor and the park and rec chair. Uh, nobody from staff got back to me, and I asked, please let me know your thoughts. Um, and then on July 13th, I sent it to uh, mayor, staff, and the council, and park and rec chair. And it did go out to uh, the park and rec members. 
But again, did you try to contact Joe other than an email? No, I did not. And again, in my opinion, that's, it just continues to show your, you, you claim that you want to work with staff, and by doing stuff like this, in my opinion, you're not really trying to work with staff. It would have taken two minutes for you to pick up the call, pick up the phone and call Joe and say, hey, you know, I know you guys were working on this. You know, I have some questions. I got some complaints. What, you know, what is the end game here? What's the goal? Because these are the complaints that I had. This would have never had to come up. This, or it may not have come up, depending on obviously what was resolved. But again, and I'll say it till I'm blue in the face. You claim to say all this, but yet you never follow through. And you, in my opinion, are not trying to work with staff in any way, shape, or form. Well, Ms. Councilmember Rickard, you have your right to your opinion. I, I prefer that it's in documentation um, because I want to be able to go back to that. Um, and that's my prerogative. You can, you can have conversations with staff if that's what you choose to do. I prefer to have it in documentation such as this so that when I don't get anything back from them, I do have my documentation that I, I did reach out to them. Um, and I did neglect to put the entire council on there. I apologize for that. Um, I did, though, on my follow-up um, later include uh, the entire council. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I, I can't believe that, and I, I don't want to, I, I'm appalled at the installation of this, that that's what, how it was done. I, I just, I'm. Then bring it to staff's attention without doing it in this public forum, which you always have to do. Okay, I, I did. Councilmember Rickard, did I not? I didn't see this. How come? How come Randy, Van, and, and myself okay. weren't on that first All right. email? So, keep, keep the tone okay. Okay. so I did originally send it, and then I did send it on July 13th to everybody. I allowed staff um, from the 5th to the 13th to respond back to me, and then I brought it uh, to a higher level, which was all council. I was asking that we not go any farther with the fence installation until uh, that we put that on hold so that we could have the opportunity to discuss the issues of the pictures that I had sent, the installation of it. The issues with the pools, the concrete, the layout. Okay. We didn't do a joint meeting, and then I put in the in the memo that I sent, the email that I sent on the 13th. I did ask for a joint meeting. Instead, it came to the council. Mr. Mayor, Councilman Brian, when Corey sent out the email, I replied and I said it would. To, in my opinion, as this project is representing the city, it would that there would be value in getting together at mm -hmm. the park to view what was there and to come up with something that would you know to to determine if it this is a go forward or what can be done to to address the issues. Mr. Mayor, an easy thing to do then is if she got some response, regardless of how much it is. Say, okay, we're meeting at such and such date. If you can be there, be there. If not, you don't have it to say. I, I, I do want to say I believe the timing of this was critical. Um, there was a request for a meeting that, that I believe Dan and Mary put together for a joint meeting midday for park and rec, for staff and council to get together. And I, I believe... That, that that was an unfortunate timing that had come in to Corey and Corey ended up being off for the week and Lori didn't know anything about it. And so it really got dropped in other extenuating circumstances. And so that meeting didn't take place. And, and I think we go back to us not communicating with more than one other council member. We count on staff to do that. And it ne needed to be coordinated to can we all make a new meeting 
or a midday meeting to go down there and talk about the specifics of the poles, the concrete, and the layout, which, which what I'm seeing were the questions that came up on the 5th or the comments that came up on the 5th. Um, when the joint meeting, I, and I, I may be misunderstanding or misremembering the, the time frame, but I thought when we were trying to put this together was, was the week before Corey was off for the week. And, and it didn't come together because all those people had to be contacted. I, I think it, it made sense when it was brought to my attention by Corey that looking at the pictures, do we have an understanding of, of the, the joints, the sagging, the, the concrete, and the squareness, I think it was, before the fence went up. The reason the fence was, was held up is how much of this might have to be reworked before the fence went in, in place. And having talked to, to Mr. Williams, the, the misunderstanding over 14 or 15 feet wide versus 21 feet wide, I don't know that that was clearly understood before we started. So I think that was why get everybody together so it's not park and rec versus council versus staff. Um, everybody's in the same place at the same time and we come out at least agreeing, if not appreciating the result, we'd all agree on the results. And so I think that was the intention and maybe because of the lack thereof, it came as a, an RCA to the, the council. I still think that, that there, it makes sense to be in full agreement on what it is that we're trying to get, accomplish and, and what is a professional level. You know, sometimes we, we do try and get by on, on donated equipment and a one-day festival is different than 365 year-round where, yeah, I didn't think about kids swinging on it or jumping on it or using it as a balance beam or you know, the other types of things. So there's a reason that park equipment tends to be a little more expensive because you got to put up with, with all comers year-round and unsupervised. Mr. Councilmember Bettinger. I think this could have been handled better, though, instead of um, being handled the way it was. I mean, it could have been an email sent to staff saying, yeah, you know, I was out there, I noticed the, the poles of bulges. There's something we can do about that. There's rough joints on there. On there. Uh, Cracks in the concrete, just rust on the pipes, and paint the pipes. Try to adjust them or address them through staff before we get this far. Well, and, and, that, and, that, and that never happened. No, I, it did. It's right here, July 5th. Email sent to Mayor, Corey, Lori, Joe, and Park, and Rec Chair. So Joe and Corey and Lori were copied on that. And they received complaints over 4th of July weekend on the rusty poles, the cracked concrete, and the layout is not uniformly spaced. That's where, where it started. That's why it, it became nobody's responding. So it was elevated on the, the 13th to a request for a, a meeting, I believe. Mm -hmm. At some point there was a request for a meeting. And, and in that there was no response. And so it came to an RCA saying, well, at least make it formal with the council, if I'm understanding mm -hmm. the progression. But it, it was brought up to staff first. Well, and and well, I, I think the, the, the problem is, is staff was doing the best they can. Corey and Lori have nothing to do with it other than they're, they're part of the staff, they're part of directing it. Joe's doing what he can. You know, it's up to Joe to try and research, and that's where I think some of the confusion over the width came up because what he found is different than what was planned. Um, and then there was a question on the, do we not understand something about, you know, surface cracks versus structural cracks? Do we not understand rusty poles and rough edges around welds? And the spacing, if it's not uniform, is that critical to it or not? And so I think that the, the point was, if staff couldn't answer that, bring it, to, bring it to council and have a joint meeting of council and park and rec. What were you thinking and what did we authorize? And say, okay, if that's what you were thinking, that's what we authorized, proceed. If we were thinking something different than you were thinking, and obviously, it hadn't been communicated well enough to staff, in this case to Joe, what Park and Rec specifically wanted. So therefore we came up with different widths. Cut apart pipe and welded back together. That was wasted labor. Now I appreciate that Dan and, and helped Joe 
weld the pipe back together. Had we known, we wouldn't have cut it apart and had to weld it back together. Mr. Mayor, I'm not denying I didn't get an email. I got the email. There was no question on here for me to respond. Exactly. There's statements. There's statements. There's no not questions. Well, I got Mr. Mayor, regardless of the, that point, I think we owe our staff at least a phone call rather than an email. You know, you know, I know in a given day, you know, I'm on my computer all day long, and I, there's, I miss emails all the time. You know, again, before we go to this method, and I'm going to leave it at that, because there's a lot more I'd love to say, but I won't. Please do. No, that's no. Um, I think we owe our staff at least a phone call, above and, you know, above and beyond just an email. Emails can be missed. Obviously, Joe said it wasn't. It was misconstrued that the way he interpreted it, he didn't see a question in there, and that could be. But again, it's so much easier to make that phone call and just say, hey, you know, th these are things that, you know, somebody called me on. You know, I want to know, you know, what's our plans moving forward instead of, in my opinion, making an attempt to, for staff to look bad. But. And we did have dimensions in the original layout. And that was presented to the council. How did we end up with? And we knew it was going to be. We knew it was going to be used pipe. We knew where the fence was coming. We approved everything that's being done out there, and it, we and it's not done yet. You know, they, they could sand down that pipes and, and paint them. Their the defense. There's lots of work to be done out there yet, and if we have suggestions to improve it, great. It, and this, they got it set up so this isn't permanent. You know, if it goes over big and then everybody loves it, we can invest in new pipes. But right now, we don't know if everybody's going to love it or not. So the way that way it's being done on a low dollar system, and if people want to try it out, great. We knew that all along going in. It was it was said it was used pipe. Let's have suggestions to help instead of criticize and. and Break down. Uh, you know, again, and maybe it's my business background. If, if I got this email, it said issues. Poles rusty, rough edges, some loose, some already loose. Concrete around poles already cracking, layout spacing not uniform. I would get an email back with see comments below in red. That's exactly what we designed, or we had to we had to weld this back together because we had a misunderstanding on length. We put it back together, we plan on sanding that down and painting it. I don't think that these things would necessarily needed painting had they not been cut and rewelded. I didn't, you know, I don't know for sure. Concrete cracking, surface cracks only, it's not a structural issue. Again, it's typical. You get a response back, here's your, you know, you, you can put issues, you could have put a question mark behind it, but it's typical in, in business, you come back and say, yep, that's exactly the way we planned it, or no, it isn't, here's what we're going to do about it. Layout, spacing is not uniform, it's not critical to what we're doing. This is a temporary layout because we're just trying it out. Mr. Mayor, not everybody's you and not everybody does things how you do it, so everybody is different. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that, it's saying there wasn't a question. There, there were statements to respond to. And again, everybody's different. I deal with hundreds of emails a day. I don't answer every email the exact same way, so you can't speculate and expect somebody to read an email and respond the way you would normally do in business. Not everybody operates that way. That's what I'm saying. So you, you're speculating again that because this is how business should do it, that's how Joe is going to do it or somebody else is going to do it. That's not the way the world works. Okay. Plain and simple. Again, a phone call would have been so much easier. Mr. Mayor. How's my radio? Yeah, my, my July 5th email I asked, I am requesting that fence installation be, uh, be placed on, and I missed a D in placed, on hold at this time. Please let me know your thoughts. That was a question. And the only two thoughts that came back to me were from Park and Rec Chair Perilla and the Mayor. So that was a question that, that asked for an answer. So I, and again, I, document things because then I have my I have it in a file that that's how I did it I know my side of it and I'm comfortable with my side of it and how I did it 
um, if that's not how you respond or do something, that's fine. That, that's up to your prerogative. Um, my, my big issue is in looking at this, I, I think it's, um, in, in no disrespect to, to staff, because they did what, what was approved, but this, to me, looks terrible. And I, I don't believe it is something that we should ask our residents to accept. I, I just don't, to me, it doesn't meet some basic standards in construction. So, so let, let me try and, and put a bow on this. We're mm -hmm. approaching 9 o'clock. Um, we, we've beaten up how it was handled in the past. Mm -hmm. And so let me, let me say that um, if there's questions in the future, if I can ask all council members to put them in the form of a question, um, where appropriate, contact Corey or Joe, because they are the supervisors in these areas, and, and put the question to them appropriately. Um, give them a chance to respond to a specific question. And at that point, if, if you don't feel that you're getting a response, follow up in a documented way that um, that's agreeable. You know, if, if you ask Corey a question and, and she has a response that says, I don't agree, and you'd like to take it to the council to get the council's agreement on it, then bring it to the council. If she says, I don't understand, then clarify. If she just refuses to respond to you, then deal with that at that time. That being said, let's learn from that, so how we can ask our questions of staff more effectively. The issue at, at hand right now is what level of quality and integrity does the council expect to see in our park equipment? Is this sufficient as used, used pieces of equipment put together on a potentially temporary basis until we see how it's utilized? Will its utilization be impacted by the quality of the installation versus the demand for the activity. And if, as we said before, if it doesn't look like it's getting used and we want to utilize that fence in some other capacity, that would be a future discussion. But for right now, to make a decision on this, and specifically the question at hand was the poles, the concrete, and the layout prior to the fence going in, does the council as a whole have any concerns as to the quality of this installation that we can address now so it can move forward. Mr. Mayor. Council Member Rick. And the only question I have there is, it would be back to Joe and staff, is this, what above and beyond this, do they plan on doing any, anything addition to this? Is this, are we complete right now or are we making changes? All right, Joe, do you know that? My personal opinion, I think one of them is too wide. I think too heavy. Okay, let me, let me ask Joe. So your opinion is it's too wide, and that this, the, the weight of the poles themselves before kids start climbing on them and things, is they're potentially sagging. What about... The, the other comments were the, the concrete. Is the concrete, the way the poles are in right now, sufficient? Those cracks, are they surface cracks? It's just surface cracks. It's not to do with the structure. Okay. Um, the, the layout, there's something about spacing that uniform. When I was down there, it did look like maybe some of the poles were closer to each other on one end than the other. It might be a couple inches off. Okay. Is that going to affect play? Is that going to affect appearance from a quality park installation for the council's sake? Is council okay with that? So as the council thinks that over, then the question would be, Joe's, under, Joe's belief that these are this is too wide, Mr. Williams' belief that it needs to be this wide, what would the council like to see? Looking at the sags that are already in there, I would, I would tend to, to go with Joe's understanding and if this is a a, um, a trial again 14 feet three people 
and you're gonna have four plus feet per person? That's way too narrow. I've played on about uh, 10 different of these things. Some of them are, um, that's, if you would notice what we had out here, once you got uh, people in there, it would get small real quick. Depends on, depends on what you're playing, but if typically if you're playing foosball leagues, you're going to have three on a pole. And the sagging, the sagging has nothing to do with the game. You know, if it sags, it doesn't mean, it has nothing to do, or you're putting the ball in the net, that's the game, not holding the back one straight. So if you're, whether you're holding it straight or if it's sagging six inches, it has nothing to do with the game. All right, so council? Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Rickard. Joel, question, two questions to you, actually. Uh, do you see the, on the ones that are sagging right now, in the picture, do you know if those are a straight piece of pipe or are those a piece of pipe with a coupler in it? They all got couplers. They all got couplers? Okay. The wheels are not in the pipe. Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. I understand what you're referring to. These are, thread, these are threaded couplers? Yeah, there's an extra pipe in the middle. There's a pipe inside the pipe. So, it makes it really so the couplers are threaded? We can take the pipe out of the middle and that reduce the weight almost in half. I think the, the pipe in the middle is for strength, though, right? Well, it's all theory. As of right now, yeah, because the coupler. Well, question being two questions. How wide do you think we could structurally go and still? keep a straight pipe number one and if we can do that can we get those length the pipes from Ron? Oh Ron's pipe is 21 feet. All this pipe. Everything I've seen from the internet is 14 feet. So if we take it out to compromise the dam to 16, 18 feet that would help it So you think the widest we could go, Joe, comfortably is 18? That's the 18 more. That's the maximum. With a solid pipe, no coupler in the center. So therefore, you you eliminate the interior pipe that you already have to help strengthen that joint. So a lot of that weight's going to go out of there too. Right. Mr. Mayor, come on, Brian. I think part of the issue was with the sagging pipes. You're going to have issues with the. Um, PVC rotating back and forth. Joe, I thought when we chatted, another one broke off or fell down. Was that right? PVC? Oh, no, all oh, the the crossbars. The kids are hanging on them. Yeah, so the kids are so the kids are hanging on them, and though and um, so I think if the kids are going to be hanging on them, which we know they will, you know, then we need to look at making having that strength there, even if it is a solid pipe. Um, Having the um, cross member be able to slide back and forth, it probably is not going to make sense to to paint the crossbar, but it may look maybe probably would be beneficial to at least paint the upper beam, the upper post on the side, holding the post up. <coughs> um, yeah, I just don't want them. Don't want. I think if you painted an enamel on pipe, it'd be better than raw galvanized, but. Yeah, I, I think if, if you're going to paint the uprights, you might as well paint the cross beams too. It, it may wear off because of the PVC eventually, but still would look. I, I think a nice, nice enamel would slide easier than a bare pipe. All the out there, the thing out there is made to get removed, it might be replaced. So if we were to start again at 16 or 18 feet, no joints. We'd have to debate whether a pipe in a pipe is better. Um, so the, the the pipe that 
you say it's made to come out the fence it's a little easier recording a fence that's smaller than a fence that's growing if you expect that it, if anything there there's less lineal footage you would, wouldn't expect it to be significantly higher to reduce lineal footage on a fencing but I think that the, the appearance is important um, I think it should be a painted pipe it should be somewhere between the 14 and the 21 that um, if 14 is what's common on the internet and 21 is common with when Mr. Williams has researched again I think we need to have something that you're in a park, in a part of a park that's not supervised. You can expect it to be a jungle gym of some sort. How do we make it the best we can? I, I think it needs to look attractive. Um, as best we can, lay it out so it's consistent. I do think that you know our our park equipment should look like professional park equipment. So from this point, what do we as a council want to do? I think we need to make a decision on length on painting, uh, having staff be the ones to talk with the fence people. Would that be Joe? Would you, normally, would you be talking with him, Joe? I want to talk to him once in my life. Okay. Who on staff, Corey, would be best to do that? Joe? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I know, and... and I think they need to deal with somebody on staff who's authorized too. All right, so we we check on the fence pricing. Have Joe check on fence pricing. What are we going to do? Sixteen or eighteen feet? I, I do. It does look a bit long. Again, if you're figuring, typically in a soccer configuration, the most you're going to have on it a regulation is three people. 16 feet, you got a lot of room there. You could have more. You could have four people, you still got a lot of room. Was the intent to have PVC all the way across so that you, if you did have more people, you could always add no. in more people? No, oh, that's the whole no. point of foosball. You want to slide along the pole. You have to keep your hands on the PVC and the PVC has well, to work. We have different different lengths right now, is, I, I guess, where I'm, where I'm kind of. Yes, because you have defense and offense. Yeah, so you have different amount of peoples at different pools? See, like, the, the point is, if, if the defenders are hanging on to that pole and they're keeping their hands on it, they both can't run over to the same spot. Right. And so that kind of that keeps your spacing. And so rather than have six people lined up here in defense, you have two on defense, and therefore you intentionally have a shorter PVC. Right, yeah, I understood that. I was, it was a question of, from a uniformity standpoint, does it really matter if all the lengths are different or if they're all the same? Because, yeah, you still could have two defenders. You can't you had, slide that. If you had more people. But the whole object is for the PVC to slide over your metal pipe. Mm -hmm. So if you had a long piece of pipe that, and you had your goaltender in, in foosball, which is one, and that's long. you can't go from one edge to the other if that piece of pipe is X along because your object is to hold on to the PVC and not let go. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to slide on that pipe. If, if that if, length is 10 feet long, I'm never going to be able to get to that far side. You would have the other person. I'm just rem I just don't remember if the length, from what I remember when I looked at it, the current length of the PVC pipe was different. And it's supposed it's to be. It's supposed to be. Okay. Yes. All right. Each, each other one you have three attackers on two defenders type thing. So the idea here is you don't want them letting go of that because you might as well get rid of the pipe at that point point. you just get soccer. But the point of foosball is you're anchored to this small piece and therefore you do have to run away over there, you do have to run away over there because you don't want to have this, this wall of feet to go through. And so that needs to be smaller if the rule is you got to keep your hands on the PVC. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, they do need to be alternating longer and shorter. Okay, I envisioned it differently, so that's why I'm asking. I, you know, have played foosball in the past. Um, so if we, so if I understand it, we're at 21 feet post, 
21 foot post now, Joe? Yeah. So if we did change it, we're going to have to put in different. Or would we have? To, we, I'm assuming we'd have to put in different holes and move them move them in. At least one. Yeah. Yeah. One second. So. I think we've conceded that. Is it 14, 16, 18? And right, Mike. So, so, in, so in theory, by redrilling the holes, we could, it, we would, um, the the width between one and the other might be off by a couple inches, but we can, you know, look at straightening that one, out, those couple out, or however many there are. I don't. Remember. If that was our intention, as a council, we would instruct Joe to make sure that, within a plus or minus, that the left and right differences between the the offense and defense is consistent. Mm -hmm. If we're re relaying out one end, you pick the end that's most consistent right now and relay out the other. So if we're okay with the, uh, the one end concrete, we want the poles to be as evenly spaced as possible. We'd like to see them painted with an enamel rust -oleum or appropriate outdoor paint. And what length would we like them to be? It's compromise at 18. Yeah, that's what, it's, that's what I was looking at. Yeah. 18 works for me. All right, paint should take care of the rust. The concrete, uh, half of them will be relayed and spacing will be as uniform as we can make them. The length will be 18 feet, all one section, no joints. Do we want an inner pipe or not? Just let them finish it. I think you're if gonna it bowls, you, you adjust, that's all. Yeah. I think you're going to add to your weight by, you know, considerably if you put an inner pipe in there. If they, does that inner pipe go end to end? Yeah. I don't know that would matter then if you're hooked on the ends, but... Is it stronger? Is it noticeably stronger when you do that? But do you think it, it bows less? With the inner pipe? I mean, we can, you know, like I said, it's all designed to take apart to change stuff out, so we can try it without it. If it is, we know it's will that, uh, Will that be the case when the fence is up? All right, any other comments? Yes, sir. The size of the fence, we have to change the internal dimensions. We have to reduce the width from 25. Yeah, and Joe's going to take care of that. Mr. Mayor? Councilman Ricker. The only other comment I would have is if, if squareness is pretty decent, and we're, I would say, if, so then we pick one side, that we're, the side that we're going to move. Find the one side that the concrete's broke up the most if it doesn't matter on our squareness. Do you get that, Joe? Pardon? So when we're looking at, at which side to take out of the ground, which, which uprights to take out of the ground, the, we're looking at the condition of the concrete, we're looking at the spacing between the, the two rows and the condition of the concrete to decide which case is most severe, take that one out. So which one is the concrete and the spacing best? Leave that as your anchor side and change the dimensions on the other side. Anything else? Take care of what color, you wanna go blue? Whatever's inexpensive, like we can find something on sale, <laughs> a dark color. Maybe there's a bunch of paint recycles and we mix it all together. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you get that brown from? <laughs> Anything else?
Do we have enough information now to make a motion on Tuesday? My opinion, if it's the same price or less, I'd prefer it to be less because using less material. Not much. Six, six feet shorter as well. Yeah. But, so, but I would say if it's the same price or less, we've already authorized it. Council agree? Anything else on the uh, foosball? All right. Cat loader. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Brian. Um, I know on the um, equipment replacement schedule that this year the cat loader was um, up for replacement. The current loader is 40 years old. It is leaking hydraulic oil and the transmission as well is leaking. Uh, I know Joe has mentioned it's not economical to drive it to use it outside of the shop, but it's as it's you know not very feasible to get from point A to point B. The four wheel drive isn't working, so um, he he mentioned that he was trying to use it to move snow around and it got stuck. Um, Let me just told you up there before you beat it up too bad. We want to sell this thing. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we do have it in our capital improvement bucket. At, budget so I would more accentuate the new one needs to do the following and, and I, I think the part here about <laughs> taking pressure off the skid loader and uh, you know something we could drive out on roads and move trees and so I, I think it's it's additional capacity is really what we want to emphasize so nobody comes back and uses this okay to lower our trade-in price <laughs> Um, so, so Joe's looking at to get to get a loader that um, has the quick attach with the auxiliary hydraulic in front, so that down the road we can get other attachments. Um, he had made put some attachments with some possible um, replacements. Just for an example, um, that one did have a, a set of forks on it, so that's something that can be used. We can um, uh, Offset load of the skid loader, he mentioned that when they go out for trees, um, if, if after a storm trees are down, it'd be nice to be able to take the loader out to help clear off some trees instead of just the skid loader. Um, and down the road, uh, if need be, we can, we can add on a grapple bucket, a snow blower, you know, other, other attachments that are available. Uh, right now, he's been just looking primarily at uh, Caterpillar or John Deere. Any uh, two? Current dealers have any used equipment? Do, do deer or cat dealers have anything right now? Used? I think we're at the prime price and we're going to stay in a 70000 dollars range. We'll look out for those guys outside your state. Okay. I did find one up in work branch, so. though. Next machine. Ken Alex. I was looking at the Caterpillar site today, and I guess the one question that I just didn't know, um, what's the big difference between like a, uh, like a 936 and a 906? I'm just guessing the 906 would be smaller. Is, is, in, is Because there seem to be more used 906s out there. Um, is, it, is it also a matter of how high it can lift? One of the questions you had that uh, that came up at the road and bridge was the uh, the lifting capacity and, and height. Um, is the nine thirty right now less than you would prefer it to be? And so it lifts as much as you as high as you need it to. Okay, so when you say 
same size or size bigger in, in current understanding the um, the 930s that are on the market are the same as the 930 we have now only current in their construction but as far as it's lifting capacity and lifting height a 930 now is going to be the yes. same as our 930 before right. and 936 is going to be Increased in that. Yeah. How about um, length as far as getting into the places you want it to go to? 36 and 30 going to be the same? All right. Other council comments or questions? And the used ones you're looking at, do you think there's trade value or we have to go to? I honestly have to talk to them. I don't know. I don't call one of them to see what they do. Okay, so how do we want to approach this? We want to give Joe authorization to be talking to people to get us some specific information so we know specifically what we're talking about for trade and, and feature and dollar. So I think at this point we authorize them to. Uh, start his investigation in, in earnest and bring us back information. That makes sense to the council? He could. Um, it's again, it's like a fire truck when you, you find one you want, by the time it comes back to council, it's gone. I think, I think that, that one of the differences here is um, we're dealing with a fire department that's already done this. On, on their side, and they've been watching us for a while. I think we're, we're getting Joe's starting to collect some information, and I think realistically saying we're going to get a bucket and maybe one or two attachments. But if we get them, like we said at the road and bridge, that the the must haves and the would like to haves, the must haves. I've got to have the the quick quick attach. I've got to have this. I got to have this. So if, if he defines those things and then the things he'd like to have. Within the price range, we can we can then see what he's finding, and at the next meeting, say you know what, we've got the money. You can go up to this much. Make sure you get the must-haves. So I think for him to at least do a little more research, find out what our trade-in is worth in this market, or do we have to just sell it outright to somebody else? I think we have a little more information would be helpful to have. We need to know if there really is any trade-in value on, on a purchase like this. Well, we're back to selling it for peanuts. Even though it's a really good machine. It's an awesome machine. Yeah, it's just it's not exactly what, what we want. It's right a tremendous now. job. That you can, we need something more versatile. Well, to get the $15,000, it's like $15,000. To them as a trade-in or as a trade-in? Well, that's, that's, I think, the question at hand is, you know, if we go to one of these guys, are, is that thing worth anything on trade or? Like, you, we got a, listed a couple on here, like Michigan Cat, looks like it's selling this one. You know, if we were to go buy this one, would they give us anything for that on trade? Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. I think Joe yeah. needs to ask some of those questions too. This, this I'm pretty sure this exact same one on Equipment Trader is on Cat's Caterpillar's site listed under their wow. used machines. At least that's what it looked like to me. What? I'm sure it is. Yeah. So I don't I don't know how that works. You know, I'm assuming you're working with a diff different vendors to who's gonna bring it get it sold. So All right, so is it is it clear enough what we're gonna ask Joe to do? Like how to get more information to us so we can authorize him to proceed. All right. I have a request on uh, 20232 Wolf Ram. 
regarding the end of the driveway. Mr. Mayor. Council Member Brian. Um, this resident mentioned that the, um, the their end of their driveway is, is their driveway is all concrete, and that their end of their driveway has been was broken up. Um, the, there was at least one incident where the the snowplow drove over a corner, um, and it you know broke off the corners. I attached some pictures. I'm just wanting to looking to get some information on how to the, handle these types of issues and resolve this one. Um, the driveway is not uh, currently level to the um, to the street, so I could you know so um, if you know if there was something where the, anything went off a little bit, it isn't to the right away, but you know it would easily could easily catch a corner. Um, where where does something like this fit in with to uh, either fix or repair or to repair the driveway or uh, address the residence issues. And again, this is a cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. And I have been out and seen this. I did. And it does look like that cul-de-sac is a bit narrow. I talked to Joe about it. And there's a there's a couple of things that the second page of pictures is is that where 203 is going on to sodium yeah. sodium and I talked to Joe about that before it does seem to be um, appropriate to, to fill that and to grab to uh, flat up over that and this seems to be obviously a radius where the people are not sticking to the blacktop. Um, first thing I noticed driving out there was was those potholes in either side of entering that cul-de-sac. It did look like the cul-de-sac was narrow in the middle. You could see where we had driven off it when we were plowing, pulled up side, and where cars seem to be going. I don't know if it's cars or garbage trucks or school buses, but they don't seem to be able to stay in the blacktop when they're making that. Um, it does seem that we would want a smooth edge there. And uh, I think that is something that we could work out a portion of it that's that's in our right of way and maybe go back to that expansion joint or saw cut or whatever it is there. Have the homeowner take a portion of it, we take a portion of it, but blend the blacktop together. And he can do what he wants with the blacktop to the concrete, but Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Rickard, you are opening a huge can of worms. Absolutely. And by me looking at this picture, I see cracks everywhere in that driveway. So you, there's no way you can tell me with a certainty that by dry, that a snowplow went over that corner and that's what broke it. So you start repairing one driveway at any cost in the city, you're going to get everybody in the whole town saying, "Hey, you guys did this to my driveway." Well, not I, we are, you know, I live on a corner, my road's wide enough and people cut the inside regardless of the winter, summer. So I never get grass growing there. So it basically looks like this, but I don't expect the city to come out and try to fix that. I think if you even slightly suggest that the city pays to prepare any of that, you're going to open a huge can of worms and it's a big, big mistake. How about brush more than one day? Seen two black, two concrete driveways, broke the same way. They're on the street, straight ways. You know, you, well, you do one, one Well, you look at the pictures, of the cracks are all the way up the driveway. And it won't be just concrete, it'll be bituminous, it'll be gravel. You know, if I hit your, your fall cut in the gravel, it's going to be on and on and on. You're, yeah, it's a huge can of worms. Don't, you don't even want to start. Third driveways for them to maintain coming into Ontario Road. So even if we, even if the plow did did make did catch the corner and it was and we and we had conversation and the resident had conversation with staff about it. It's and we haven't really 
um, we don't say in our spec, I guess we kind of assume that their driveway should be flush with the, the road, but we but it's not inspected or enforced at all. Is it is it still not our problem? No. No. We've talked to the city attorney about it already, and he said it's in the road right away. So it is not it's, it's within our legal rights to maintain the roads and that. And again, you know, in my opinion, based on the way the rest of that driveway is cracked, you can't sell me on the fact that that was done by the snowplow. You know, I could see if that was the only portion of this whole driveway, the two corners. Well, the plow came in straight and well, what pushed about, snow. But again, what about all these? I understand. It's all the way through here. I understand there are other corners. That's, talked, that's the straights. I understand there are other corners and other cracks. The plow came in straight into the cul-de-sac and caught the corner of the driveway. As it, as it was just to, to clear off the to clear off the blade. I could see if, if the plow did make contact because the concrete is doing something like this. Mm -hmm. Actually, if the plow would have hit it, it would have done damage to the truck. They could be liable to the city for damaging the plow because it's not that driveway wasn't installed properly. That's cracked from weight driving on top. Okay. Yeah, we talked, we chatted about that on last week. Thank you. All right. Anything else on that one? And road evaluation proposal from Shane. Questions on that? Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm not in favor of spending any more money on studies at this point. We, you know, when we became a city, we did capital improvement plan for our roads for everything. Uh, 2012, there was a full uh, study on the blacktop roads. 2015, it's been updated. There's been thousands of dollars spent on it, and none of the information has ever been used to. to uh, finance the plan, so it doesn't pay to keep doing plans that you're not going to fund. Um, Shane, already from the 2012 one, said the min minimum that we should have for a year is 240000 We're not even going to fund that. Not even close. So why, why, do, why keep doing studies and say we need more? We know the roads haven't gotten better. Do you have a five-year capital improvement plan in place? We keep, we're, let's do one year. Let's do something in one year. We won't even fund that. Any other comments? It's 2012 plan. He had he had a recommendation there, $240,000 per year. And we're getting close to that if you do a 50, 50 assessment. You know, so if you got 120, so we should have at least 120 a year we should be putting in there. So we're getting close to that now, but but we're so far behind, we got to play catch up. Any other comments on this, Mr. Mayor? Because my record. You know, we. It's obvious that we need to do something. It's it's like Councilman Bettinger said. I just hate throwing dollars, and they seemingly are going nowhere. You know. We did do the road and bridge study, and we didn't do anything with it. It's just, 
I know we need to we need to come up with some plans and we need to start taking some actions on you know our roads. Again, we haven't done anything significant for how many years? You know, again, you know it's, it's all based on funding. We had the meeting the other night about how are we going to fund it. Um, again, until we really know how we're going to fund it, you know, I hate throwing money just out there for for this or that and the other thing. You know, I guess I, I was all in favor of, you know, if, if Shane's already recommended that Old Viking needs to be overlaid, you know, we picked that as our first primary project and just go ahead and do it. But again, even with that said, we got to figure out a way we're going to pay for it and get the residents to buy in on that. So anytime you start talking assessments, nobody's happy. Well, I, I agree. We don't want to keep being reactionary, waiting for things to break down and, and do them. I, I would like to see a formal uh, five-year plan you know, based on the roads he's looking at, keeping the ones that are in decent shape from becoming poor shape and, and starting a plan to fix up the ones that have deteriorated. Um, I think it's a good investment. I don't think it's just throwing good money after bad. I think it's a good investment. And, uh, you know, the discussions we've had is, yeah, there's a lot of money needed. Where are we going to get it all? And I think this is a necessary step to find out if we can assess 50%. I, I don't know that we'd get away with, you know, 50% other than, you know, the, the example we had, if the numbers are true on old biking, if we can spread it out over 66 homes, that seems more reasonable. Is it still within the 429 test? You know, we, we didn't ask that question. We didn't answer that question. Um, but as we discussed in our meeting the other day, that same formula is not going to work on you know, road with 10 homes or 20 homes as opposed to 66 homes. If we looked at, at Garnett as an example, wasn't that about four or $500,000? And what is there, 20 of you on the street? Not even, I don't think. So, I mean, that, that would be a completely different economics. And we wouldn't be able to assess that much. So I, I think that having a, 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 a plan in place that takes a variety of roads, including ones that we know what we spent on Ebony and Garnett in the re recent years, what we projected for Old Viking in the Rogers Lake area, but then these additional homes saying, here's, here's how we can do a maintenance plan to keep it from deteriorating. I think this is a good investment and a kickstart that we've needed. And we, we've had a lot of frustration over we haven't properly funded or, or um, budgeted for it because we didn't have a realistic plan. We had a big number on the road study that says if you can do it at all, you've got to have three million bucks. And, and I think it needs to be a specific plan that says here's what we're doing year one, year two, year three, year four, and five. We had a every every blacktop city street in that plan, but no specific plan forward in specific years. And I think this is a good investment, and I think that we have money budgeted for engineering that and we haven't utilized extensively in the past couple of years. I think it's a good investment, and and maybe the kickstart we need to help the road committee, the road advisory group, and the uh, um, council work together to, to move forward on this. So. Mr. Mayor. Council Member Rickard. Question to Corey. What funds do we have left in engineering for the year, budgeted, do you know? I do not, but um, um, we haven't utilized a lot this year for engineering, just because it's very <coughs> Basically, we make some house plans and some few things here and there. So I guess, in your best guess, we have $3,500 in the budget? Yeah. But I can confirm that, but I would have to say um, we probably have well over 10000 And And again, in, in my opinion, okay, we, we do have money in the budget for it, but can we use that money elsewhere better? Yeah, I think so, but... Again, I don't necessarily think that this 
based on the information Shane's going to provide, is actually going to truly tell you how to assess or what it's going to do to assessment and how, you know, what it's going to do to the property values and, and are you going to be able to assess. I don't think you're going to know that until you actually go through with the plan like Bob was talking about and start laying things out and actually specifically seeing what's the project cost, how many households are affected, you know, either directly or indirectly, and, you know, get a guesstimate on what it's going to I think a feasibility be. study is still absolutely necessary. But I think here you've got a plan saying this makes sense over five years. Now when you do a feasibility study and you talk about how you're going to assess it, when other people say, again, we know there's going to be some, some pushback on the first ones if people are used to, after all these years, not being assessed. Um, but if we say, here's the plan, each year it's going to get less surprising to people because they see we're working a plan and they know we're coming to their neighborhood to make improvements that are valuable to them and we have a plan that says, our feasibility study says we're going to assess a certain amount of this. I, I think that it it's, gets the ball rolling on what we talked about at our last meeting and how do we identify um, what needs to be done, identify how it gets paid for, and what means we can do, whether it's levy or assessment or even potentially a portion of it being monitored. But what I'm stating, though, is even though we... Shane puts his plan together, that still doesn't tell you how... That's the end. That's not the end. It's the start. So that's why I'm saying you, you start with a project like Old Viking that we talked about. We already have kind of a cost. From there, we, we need to know how we can... Because, again, we could come up and have Shane do this for X amount of dollars. We could then still pick Old Viking and then realize, based on cost and assessments, you know, through property value, that we may not be able to do it. And then what do we do? Now we just threw, what, $3,200 away that we just realized we, we didn't need to do because we can't afford or assess... You know, the people on Old Viking. But I, again, I think coming in with a plan is helpful because Old Viking may be the outlier. Old Viking may be the only one we have that concentration of properties that, that allows us to distribute that money that efficiently. And, uh, and I, that's why I think having a study here saying the, the criteria for Old Viking would be different in this neighborhood and this neighborhood. And therefore, when you're talking about assessments or capital funds needed from the city, don't plan an old Viking being your model. That's an outlier because of its cost versus its, its distribution of cost. But his, his plan isn't going to de define that. And that's my, that's and my his, point. And his plan may be, is it going to be based on needs or is it going to be based on what we're willing to finance? That's two different things, and that's been the no, whole problem I, I th already. I think, we've, we've I think you got to identify the needs over a period of time and say, okay, how are we going to finance? We've got the needs. We've got the needs. We've got a book full of them, and we're not financing them. We're not funding them. We can keep studying. We can keep talking and talking and talking. Randy, where, where's and the plan that you've had for financing them? We're, to get up to the 2012 plan, do you think things have really changed? Yeah, I do. But, no, they but again, they've gotten worse. It's, I bet you this, the, the condition that's probably pretty much in the same order that he had in 2012 and same order as 2015. Just the prices have gone up. All right. And we so, continue talking and do nothing. Anything else on this one? All right. I have one other question for... Liz, and depending on that, for the council. With the, um, the extended meeting we had last time at PNZ, we had seven public hearings. Uh, five of those didn't get an actual hearing. We got continuation. Um, four of those had building plans involved with them. And the, the prospect of having a 45-day extension on their plans puts them into the fall and might jeopardize some of those. So my question would be the continuation of the public hearings is to the planning and zoning meeting on August 22nd. 
would, depending on, on the recommendations coming from the PNZ after those public hearings are completed, uh, would there be sufficient time, Liz, to prepare something for council if we were to have a meeting to act on that immediately thereafter, say Thursday the 24th? If that could be prepared for those that were recommended to proceed, would then the council be available on the 24th of August to meet so that those people could have a yay or a nay and either put their plans to bed or put them into motion? Oh. And Mr. Mayor, can I tell my Rick? Wrong? And that's why this whole seven o'clock meeting start time is ridiculous. In my opinion, if if you have a P and Z meeting that you know have that many items and are going to be pretty lengthy, why not change the meeting time rather than having a whole separate meeting? Well, it's it's now you're taking up. Two we nights. we had we had three meetings this year we didn't even have or within the last eight months we didn't even have and then we end up with seven in one one month but again we were well aware of how many were on the agenda so there's no reason why we couldn't have said hey because not not the month before we weren't for last month we we became aware when that meeting was planned yeah yeah but that's what i'm saying there's no reason why we can't then publish and state hey because of the well of but but you have to have a, a time definite when you when you post the public hearing you have to have a time specific. We didn't know at our last council meeting there were going to be seven public hearings at that time. But in order to post them, we had to know about them. Right. So at the time of posting, we could have stated that because of the amount of items on the agenda. Okay, well, that's, that hasn't come up before. And, and that's what I'm stating. Rather than us trying to schedule another not separate meeting on an entirely different night, when we know things come up and we know when or if it comes up that we could have an earlier start date, we should be able to do that. Well, and, and I will say again, this was a bit of an outlier. I can't remember the last time we had over 100 people at a planning and zoning meeting. I, you know, I don't know that we ever have since we've become a city. So I don't know if we knew what we were actually getting into. We knew that that one was going to be longer. I, th I still think we had a hope to uh, to get to the majority of them. The last one being more of a city action than a, an external request. Well, because you look at it right now, budget wise, we haven't even gone through anything really in the budget, and what, we, what we're scheduled for one more meeting. We're going to have to schedule more budget meetings. That's more and more meetings. It's just because we we're not thinking ahead and we're not pre-planning. In my opinion, and again, in my opinion, there, it, it, the whole P, and it may not have still allowed us to get through everything, but at least it gives you X amount of more hours allotted in that night to try to get through it, rather than wasting, you know, a, one other complete night. I don't know about the rest of you, but I do got other things going on too. Yeah, so, I'm and other comments. That was the twenty fourth. So. But it, it doesn't set them back 45 days. It's one month, it's 30 days. We would have made a decision next Tuesday and said it's going to be next month. So it's really 30 days. Well, it's not going to be until September 12th. Yeah. Okay. It's one month, about a month and a half. And if it's we would have made something on the 8th instead of the 8th of August instead of September 12th. So five weeks. Um, and I'm just saying that if, if we did something, on the 24th, we um, we can move that up by two and a half weeks. In the past, you know, as a township, they wanted it that fast. We actually made them pay for the extra meeting. Mm -hmm. I realized that it wasn't their fault that it got delayed too, but the PNZ could have. Maybe have a second meeting and continue theirs. Well, PNZ did continue. But they could have had a second meeting. They could have had a meeting this Tuesday, and we could have had it for our, our council. Yeah, but, but we didn't know that. We didn't know if the, the, the applicants were available. 
or when you continue it, you have to continue it to time and date specific. Mm -hmm. And not knowing if the applicants could make up their minds that quickly, if the staff could make up their minds that quickly. We, you know, at that point it was 10 o'clock, 10.30. You have to continue to a time specific, and that's why we ended up picking the next B and Z, because it was time and date specific, which is a requirement. Yeah, we, we debated that. Can we have something in between? Can we do something? Can we stay longer? But it was, it had been a long enough night as it was, so. Well, I'm not available that week, so. My question to the planner is, with the work you've done ahead of time and, and Obviously, you're not going to know all the conditions of the IUPs, but you generally prepare finding a fact for or against going into that. Would that even be a reasonable time frame for you to have something for the council? Yeah, I think it could work. Uh, they've got the extra month now to kind of work out some details, you know, of conditions that were specified previously so um, yeah the only trouble would be is if P and Z recommended some change you know they wouldn't have time to get it to you in two days uh, but you know it can things can be made a condition of approval it just depends what it is That's my mom's birthday. But I can make it work. I am available the 24th. So Randy is not. Mary is. Dan? Uh, I can be, yep. Also, there's a, just throwing it out, that August is a five Tuesday month. I gotta look at my schedule because I gotta travel out west towards the end of the month, beginning of September, and with Labor Day in there, I gotta figure out what and other meetings I don't want to miss. I think it's a little tactical. All right, you let us know then. Yep. Fifty-five. Adjourn the workshop.